Howdy, howdy. How is everybody doing tonight? Hope y'all are having a very nice Sunday. We've had, uh, we've had an interesting one so far where I live in the sense that we have gone from, uh, tornado warning and hail to nice bright sunshine and a, and a, an easygoing breeze in the space of just a few hours. That was fun. We actually had a tornado touchdown. Not, not today, but yesterday we had a tornado touchdown about 50 miles away. Uh, destroyed some poor son of a bitch's chicken coop, which they, they, that's most of what there is to destroy out here, to be fair. How is everyone doing today? Lore friendly to square. Good to see you. Rangonius, Retio, Santi, and Siestinator Rio. We are all about the R names today, apparently. Spend hmm amounts on getting new living room furniture today, which we've been planning for probably the past year or so in some form. That's always... I love having new furniture. It's always one of my favorite times, like, right after you've done the big, like, living room remodel and gotten new furniture and cleaned everything up. Um, but God, I hate, I hate the, the, the inevitable giant expenditure that comes along with it. You just gotta kinda grit your teeth and be like, I'm spending it and I gotta make it last at this point. And, you know, you don't have to do it very often. Furniture, if, if you're buying good furniture, it'll last a good long time, but it's just always so... Pfft, ugh, spending a bunch of money on what amounts to the... Uh, the resumption of, of equitable and, and reasonable living room conditions. <laughs> uh, Project Dark Fox. 15 months PDF. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for your support, Project Dark Fox. I really do appreciate it, man. You don't, you don't have to sub to the channel. You know, you, you, give, you give me so, so much more than a subscription, but I thank you so, so much on top of that for, for wanting to support the stream. Um... The, the subscriptions to this channel are really fantastic because they just let me take a little bit of money every month and kind of reinvest it back into the stream itself. And we have a nice thick raid coming down from Thick Mike. Oh my god. Mike, how you doing, man? How are things? Welcome in, Raiders. Make sure that my chat is actually actually scrolling so I can I can actually see what's going on. It's considered, it's considered kind of a good thing in streaming to occasionally look at your chat and have some awareness of what people are saying. Uh, others might disagree, but I, I, mean, I consider it. I consider it to be relatively important. Thick Mike, thank you so much for that raid. How are you doing today, my friend? What were you working on? I, I didn't get a chance to stop in uh, before, I, I, before I went live. Um, man, the spring. The spring, you guys, it always sees me get a little bit extra busy. During the fall, winter months, I'm always so, so able to just spend, like, most of my time inside <laughs> working working on models. And is the... Is the bot asleep? Or is that the wrong command? Oh, the bot hasn't said anything. Hang on, let me check. Let me check. Just make sure that's connected, because I didn't actually check the bot before we started the day. Thick Mike, what were you working on, man? No, it doesn't appear to be working. Let's fix that. Oh, I didn't refresh its authentication token. God damn it, give me a minute. I always forget... I always forget to refresh its stupid token. It should just take a second, though. When I redo my streaming setup, which is something that I'm I'm looking to do inside of the next six months, like I want to do an overhaul on my desk and everything, I need to have a better solution for my keyboard, because I barely have access to a keyboard when I'm on this side of my office, and it's just not cool. I 
Always a little bit of a pain in the ass when I have to do keyboard related business. Authorization codes and authentications, and oh god, we're off to such a wonderful start already. <sighs> Hang on. That should work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Authorize. Nope, that's wrong. You just fucking did it wrong, you complete asshole. <laughs> welcome! Welcome to Thunderhead Studio, where I do everything right the third to fourth time. Let's try that one more time. I know this is fascinating content. I know you're just, you're riveted. You're glued to your seat right now. Connect. That should work. That should work, probably. Let's find out. Woo, yeah, we gotta get that pro streamer command up, because man, is that accurate. The irony being, it wouldn't have worked in this case, because the bot was down. Let's see if it is connected now. Somebody go ahead and give the bot a command that it should recognize. Pretty, pretty please. No? Alright, well, give it, give it a second here. Don't make me restart you. Don't make me restart you, bot. In fact, that's probably easier. I'm just going to restart the stupid thing. Uh, I should probably have a better bot than Streamlabs chat bot. Not that there's anything really wrong with it. Other than kind of sucking sometimes. Why do I have so many windows open? Oh my god. I am so prepared for today. It is a little disgusting. So prepared. You think I do this regularly or, or something crazy like that? it's connected but it's also not showing it in chat what are you what are you what are you what are you doing to me here streamlabs chatbot yeah see it's not it's not doing its thing yet PDF I don't know if it just needs a minute or what it hasn't in the past it's usually worked just fine Actually connect to chat, please. That would be nice. That would be that'd be pretty spectacular, chatbot. Because right now you're just kind of not doing anything, and it's frustrating. <sighs> so while we get this worked out, 
what, 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 what projects you guys been working on this weekend? What are you, what are you all up to? We're gonna be doing some building. Oh my God, White Wolf! I'm so sorry I missed that for a minute with that resub on the 14 month streak. It's like 13, but more, less unlucky I hear. People say bad things about the number 13. Personally, it's always, it's always done me just fine. Why are you not connecting? Printing some terrain, Rangonius. What, uh, what, 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 what are you printing? What system is it for? I click disconnect, and I click connect, and it still doesn't show up in chat. And I'm starting to get irritated by it. Hmm. Hang on one second. Let me check something. Well, I'm not sure why it's not just connecting after I do 
all the right steps. But uh, the Thunderbot seems to be having some issues today. So we're going to give that a minute and hope that it actually connects so we can use our bot commands. Sure would be nice. Sure would be nice. Speaking of things that would things that would be damn nice, I was just thinking it would be nice. It'd be nice if Airflex popped into the chat for a minute. And there he is with that three-month streak of subscriptions, the triple-month combo. Airflex, how you doing today, man? Welcome in. Give the uh, give the Thunderbot a few minutes and uh, try some commands, and we'll see if it actually connects. I don't know why it's being such a pain in the ass right now when I've done everything right. Like, it's monitoring chat properly. It's got me connected properly. It's connected to Discord properly. It's just not connecting to Twitch for whatever reason. Project Dark Fox, would that it had an ass to spank. Someone help me. I have no ass, but I must sub. Yeah, no, it's not. It, it's not. A, it's not a sub bot. It's just a chat bot. So we're building models today, folks. That is the plan. Damn it! I even restarted. I don't know why it's being such a pain in the ass right now. Discord bots connected. Streamlabs is fine. Chatbot is successfully connected to Discord. It's just this one. And it's not showing up. I don't have any answers for this right now. Guys, I apologize if the chatbot is not functioning tonight. That is something that I'm going to have to work on a little bit later. If it doesn't fix itself, which hopefully it will in the next few minutes. Um, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hamburg Tack, welcome in, man. How you doing? I missed a few things, apparently. Yeah, murdering Thunderbot, don't tell the cops. Thankfully, uh, chatbots don't actually have any rights yet. Uh, give it time. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. A stone building for D&D. The roof and tower come off so you can see inside. Very nice, Rangonius. There are a number of, of really, really good creators that make files similar to what you're describing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, what which, which one you went with. I've done a number in that style from RM Printable Terrain that I've had pretty good luck with. Their first Kickstarter was a little bit weak, but they have increased the quality of their their STLs by a great deal since then. Would have rearranged the living room, finally finished up something for the storm report, but no, some stupid jab in the arm made it so my right arm wouldn't let me hold things. Yeah. Yeah, is that your second? And I hope that you're feeling better, White Wolf. That one knocked me out for like a good four days. That that was that was not a great time. Oh, your first shot. Okay, I see. Nothing too exciting today. Just prime the APC from aliens that you got. Lunchbox, you can't. Lunchbox, you can't be like ah, nothing exciting. I'm just painting the APC from aliens like that. That's the very definition of exciting. <laughs> what what range did you get? They had. There, there's a mini game. For aliens now isn't there like a colonial marine game I haven't really looked at it I'm not familiar with like who makes it or what what form the game takes I just know that it kind of exists and they did like a limited edition Kickstarter stretch goal for the dropship the the one of the coolest looking dropships in sci-fi history and it was a really really neat model with a lot of moving parts Hey, Pondburn, welcome in. Good to see you, man. Got the day off tomorrow so I can hang today. We are glad to have you, Airflex. Got this one from Code 2 on Thingiverse. Oh, nice. I don't know. I don't know that I've looked at any of his stuff. Rangonius, if you felt like it, could you take a link from the thing that you're printing and pop it over into the STL share channel on the Thunderhead Studio Discord? Because I, I wouldn't mind taking a look and what you're making and what else the guy might have made. I, I just, I, I like to build my folders of free shit on Thingiverse, and I have a whole external hard drive currently devoted to gathering up files that I'm like, I'm going to print that one day, and I mean, I probably won't, but I'll have it if I want to print it. That's the important thing, because who the hell knows when Thingiverse will eat itself a lot. Oh, my God. Oh, it's been a weird day. It's been a weird few days weather-wise. But here we are. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied 
with the initial painting methods that we worked on for those first four men at arms. So today, today, we're gonna build a bunch of models because I need to be, I, I need to have everything together and ready and primed so that I can just start my assembly line painting process and get done with my first 600 points of conquest, the last argument of kings. Um, I was recently given an affiliate code by Parabellum War Games. Uh, for any of you who might be interested in trying out Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings, Conquest, the, the, the biggest mouthful of, of a game name in the history of, of tabletop games, um, if any of you would be interested in trying that out, I now have an affiliate code and I can save you 10% on your first purchase from the Parabellum eStore. I did, and, and I, I, I talked about this with um, Tassos, uh, I, I assume that's how you say that, I think it's a Greek name, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, um, uh, he's their, their, whatchamacallit, social media, like engagement manager, guy, he has a different name, it's like public relations or something, anyway, yeah, he contacted me and offered me the affiliate code, and I was a little reticent at first, because I don't, we don't do like sponsors or anything like that. On this stream, uh, so I was like, "All right, all right, you give me the code. People save the money. Yeah, what do I get? What do I gotta do? What do I, I gotta plug? I gotta keep. I gotta put your name in my stream." He's like, "No, no, you just get a code and it saves people ten percent on their first purchase. And uh, like, if if a bunch of people buy, we'll we'll kick you some some money back as a percentage, you know, as like a reward." He's like, "But you don't have to. You don't have to say. You just just do what you're doing." So I'm like, "Well." Okay, that's fine, because I know we've got a few people in chat who've bought into Conquests since I started working on it, and if I can save you guys 10% on picking up a new game, like, I don't see any negative to that whatsoever. And, and so far, I've been really impressed with the quality, uh, I've been really, really impressed with the professionalism, with the community engagement, with the, um, the, the social media engagement, I've been really impressed with the, the quality of the packaging, the quality of the models, um, I think the scale is good. I think there's a lot of imagination behind the game. It looks like it's, it looks, it seems like a game that's really got a lot of coal in the, in the boiler, as it were. Like, it's, it's got enough momentum that whatever happens right now, it's gonna keep going for a while. And while some of the sculpts in the starter box are a little weak in some ways, like, the latest ones they've been releasing and showing off are really nice. Like, they're learning lessons really fast. And that's always a good sign to me. So, um, I, I, I don't want to give you the code right now because there's one thing that I have to work out. Which is that currently when you put the code into <laughs> into uh, the discount code section of their website, it gives you my personal email. I gotta fix that before, <laughs> before I can give it out. I hope you understand. Uh, but if, if you're looking at picking up Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings... Uh, and, and you feel like holding on for a minute to get a 10% discount, I should have that fixed tonight. Alternatively, you can always go get a code from, uh, I know Walter's Workshop has one. So, like, you know, I don't, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit if you use my code or not. It, it's cool, but there is another 10% code you can get from Walter's Workshop. I think he's got it posted someplace, so if you want to buy, like, tonight or something like that, you don't have to wait. Just go ahead and grab that. And, and, and plug it in. Their the e store is pretty nice. Their bundle deals seem to be a really good deal. Uh, total honesty, I think their character models are a little overpriced in some cases. The newer ones, the bigger character models, the more complex resin character models, I look at and I go twenty five dollars. Okay, the latest Spire character that they released, I look at and I say twenty five dollars. Sure. Because it's, it's big, it's detailed, it's unique. I, I couldn't possibly proxy anything else uh, for the design that they have. Like, okay, I could, but I, I don't want to because it's a really nice sculpt. Some of the other ones, like the Hundred Kingdoms hero, this is like a dude with like a mantle and he's like, I'm drawing a sword, I am a human. I'm like, I don't want to pay 25 bucks for that. Um, but I mean, that's like, that's like the worst pricing sin I've seen them make so far is that their resin characters are kind of expensive and not all of the sculpts are amazing and if that's the worst thing that I have to say about a game like that, that's pretty good coming in on that game super hard as soon as they get Dagrons I, I don't know when slash if they will try I mean like probably will it seems like they're covering all their fantasy bases but I'm not sure which faction would have it the next faction they're releasing is like an undead faction, like an undead construct faction. It seems pretty cool. They've released um, teasers for the first set of models from that recently. And they're, they're very neat. They're like bone golems. Very, very baroque in their design. They have lots of crazy organic details on them. 
Uh, I think they look pretty cool. But yeah, we're gonna build we're gonna build some basic bitch humans today. That's what we're gonna do. It promises to be really exciting. Really exciting. Just as exciting as Shock 21 subscribing for nine months. Nine months. That's a that's a Twitch baby, Shock 21. No comments about the oh, Thunderstream, baby. There we go. Yeah, sure. As long as the word baby's in there, then we've fulfilled our obligation as per Twitch TOS. Let's build some stuff. That was weird. Let me push that button again and see if it does what I want it to do. There we go. I don't, I don't know why it just... It did that. <laughs> Maybe I had the wrong uh, Stream Deck profile up. Whoopsie daisy. We are, just, we are just loaded with problems today, and it is not going to stop that much, I can promise you. I have a bunch of 3D printed bases now. Now, we started off, we 3D printed some of these bases and worked on painting them a little. And uh, so much of starting a new army for a new game is, is making decisions about how you want to approach it. At first, I was thinking I want to do paint the bases first and then attach models. After doing some models, doing some bases, trying it both ways, I have landed on. I want to go ahead and assemble the models, attach them to their bases, prime the whole thing, paint the whole thing. Mostly because I've just, I've got a lot to paint. I've got a lot to paint, and I can't afford to insert all these extra physical steps just because I want to do some extra detailing on their bases that they're mostly going to cover up. So we're going to go easy on that. I have these ones that I've already painted. These will be getting models attached to them, but for today, we're going to take these unpainted ones, and we're going to put down as many figures as we can. We've got a number of the, uh, the cavalry-style trays and bases here. These are all the new... the newly redone... Oh, no! Oh, God, why... <laughs> Why do I do these things? Not to worry, we are still flying half a ship. Ah, nothing's broken, so it's fine. But, uh, these are the newly completed Warning. fields Bigger of the Fallen bases. Blue are not approved safety gear for handling razor blades. Well, that's why we're gonna wear cut-resistant gloves, isn't it? Yeah. But hey, the Thunderbot's working! I'll be damned! Fantastic! Looks like we just had to give it a little bit of time. Project Dark Fox, thank you so much for testing that. Zio Rhymer, good to see you, man. Aliens game is another glorious day in the core. That sounds right. That sounds right to me. But I really haven't looked at that game very closely at all. I've got so many games I need to work on right now. What's picking up one more, right? Oh my god. Speaking of which, we're going to be working on a little bit of Heavy Gear Blitz next week. I'm having trouble with my motivation to work on Battletech, but I do want to work on some Mecha. So I figure why not redirect that towards some Heavy Gear Blitz since they just got their new rules release and I've already got a, a number of the models lying around. We did a little bit of that last year. I think we should pick it back up and actually finish our starter force. But yeah, we got all these, these groovy, magnetized, 3D printed bases. Um, this base set, by the way, we have... There are six variants of the infantry trays with all their own details on them. There are six variants of the cavalry trays. And then... There is, there's currently one variant of the monster tray, which isn't actually this one. I modified this one somewhat uh, for my abomination. There's one variant of this just because there aren't very many monsters yet. We'll probably be adding more to that in the future. And then there's two variants of the hero tray, which as you can see has an infantry base mounted in the center of it, slightly raised up from the rest of them. And some, some extra details, some, some stone, some, uh, some more scattered weapons and whatnot. This set of trays, I've sent the files out to Walter's Workshop and Zombie Brush Studios, both of whom are getting, or who, who paint Conquest. And they're going to be getting me back some, uh, some just reviews and general thoughts, and oh, I just want to make sure that, because it's like, I've, I've made the files, and I've printed the files, and they printed well for me. But I always have this lingering fear, like, yeah, okay, I did it, and that's great, but what if I take these files and I just give them to someone, and I don't have any input on their printing, like, are they going to have any issues? Is there some hidden printer setting that I'm not considering? So we're doing a little bit of testing, and then these files are going to go off to Steel Warrior Studios, and they should be available uh, as digital downloads very, very soon, and possibly as physicals soon after that. That that all kind of kind of depends on Steel Warrior. But... Um, I need to get some of these done so I can actually show them off, like how they look painted, and then how they work when I when I connect them up with their magnetic connectors in the bottom. Alright, let's get these over to the side here. Oh, 
I just realized I neglected to do something. There we go. Now that is done. Ah, all better. Sphere, good to see you, my friend. How did the rest of the stream go? I only got a chance to stop. I lurked for a little while. Um... But I was mostly getting stuff ready while I had you going on in the background. Some really nice work you've got going on on those... I, I, is it, is it Dwegham? They're dwarves. I'm just gonna call them dwarves. I know that they have their own name within the context of Conquest, within the con... Within, within the con... Conquest. Con... Con... Tw text... Qu I can't... I can't do it. I, I love... Portmanteaus, and I can't portmanteau conquest and context effectively. Would that be con context? Uh, that's not good. That's not good. Cosmos, I appreciate your dry sense of humor. <laughs> yes, this game Zero Rhymer is conquest, the last argument of kings. Conquest, the great mouthful of a game title. It's a pretty damn neat rank and flank uh, fantasy war game, and we're gonna we're gonna build some of the the models from it today. Very impressive showing for a new IP. Very, very creative figures. Really nice styrene sprues. Uh, we're going to be building some men-at-arms. We're going to be building some mercenary crossbowmen. And hopefully getting to building some of these big, old, mounted knights today. Starting off finishing up these men-at-arms. Do about four trays of them. Just trying to figure out Blender. Whew, that is a hell of a learning curve, Sphere. A hell of a learning curve. But it's one of those things where once you learn to use the tool, once you get past the idiosyncrasies, once it becomes second nature, it just has so much to offer. How you doing, Ion Raptor? It's good to see you. Alright, got my clippers, got my blade, let's get to work. Finish off this sprue. It seems like each sprue, it's the same sprue over and over for like the men-at-arms and the mercenary crossbowmen, and it gives you enough to build six each, and then they sell them in essentially packs of 12 or three trays, so you get two sprues with each box. Or when you go for the core set, you get uh, six trays of them, so you get four sprues. There have been some complaints about this particular model, the Men-at-Arms. And it has a couple funny things, and I'll, I'll point them out to you as I get to cleaning it up. Fuck. <laughs> well, that was stupid. I say 12, I, I meant to say we're going to be building 11 men-at-arms today. <laughs> I'll, I'll find that head later. <laughs> and I'll fix it. That was impressive. Like, I'm not close to the edge of my desk. I just, like, clipped it, and it, like, rolled down the sprue, and then partially down my arm, and then onto my lap, and then off of my leg. It was like a Rube Goldberg machine of failure. Hey, 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 Riot Sister. What? Why does my Stream Deck profile keep resetting? That's weird. Hopefully it doesn't do that again. Hello there. We are just a, a tangled knot of technical difficulties today, solving them one at a time. Because it's just, you know, it's a metaphysical truth that I'm not allowed to have things just work for me. There's nothing to do with my own incompetence, certainly not that. As I once heard someone say, I don't know what the problem is, but I know it's not me. Which may be one of the most ironic statements I've ever heard in my entire life. Hey, 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 Bueno Truno, how you doing today, man? 
Thankfully, I don't have a carpet. I have hardwood floors in here, which means I will find the head. It's just that I don't know which direction it went in. I will find it, just not right now, because it probably went, like, behind my little rolling cabinet. Is that everything off of this sprue? Seems to be. And I'm going to go on a bit of a clipping extravaganza here and just get all the parts prepped and then do all the gluing all at once. That seems like a plan to me. Assembly line construction. The most fun anyone can possibly have in wargaming. Right? <laughs> oh, God. This is just something that needs doing. I got my hobby time right now, so I'm going to do it. And thank you all for joining me today. I hope that your tasks are perhaps a little bit more riveting than mine. Hey, 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 Zombie Brush Studios. Good to see you, my friend. Welcome in. Cleaned my basement and found a random bolter for a space marine. Don't remember where it came from. I'm sure it was very frustrating at the moment that you lost it. But, you know, you play enough games, eventually you just kind of move past problems like that. This sprue has a little bit of extra flashing on a number of the parts, but I think this is the worst one I've encountered, and it's really just not that bad. Now, the way that these men-at-arms are built are such that all the parts can truly combine with all of the others. It's in the style of those older, actually probably still current, uh, like Games Workshop multi-pose sprues. Where it's like, you know, mix and match to create infinite combinations that no one will ever notice. Ooh, did I miss your question? I'm sorry, WJ. How you doing, by the way? Uh, are there any demi demi humans in this game, or is it all humans? So, WJ, that's a good question. And this is one of my the things that is to me my favorite thing about this game. Um, the human faction is... I don't want to... To say it's painfully generic is not giving it credit. It is... The human faction is very much, though, generic, low fantasy humans. Like, they've got some magical characters, and they've got some priests with magical abilities and so on, but for the most part, the humans are very, very grounded. Their armor is remarkably believable. It's all, as far as I can tell, most of it, I would say 80% of it, is based on historical European armor examples, which I actually quite like. And once you get past the Hundred Kingdoms and the human factions, it goes batshit crazy. Because all of the other factions are, like, extreme interpretations of... of fantasy concepts as far as I can tell. Uh, the other faction from the core set, which I'm not building today, but I do have... Okay, I don't have the sprue out now. I can show you one of the minis, though. The other faction in the core set are called the Spires, and they are elves from space who came here apparently with the intent of colonizing the world that the game takes place on in preparation for more elves to come through portals and to, to you know, populate the world. And there, there's something in their history about, like, you know, the colonists never came. Instead, the portals opened up and a bunch of, like, insane refugees came through. Like, there was some cataclysm back on the planet, and then they just shut the gates and walled everybody off and declared themselves kings of this new world. And they're all about biomancy. So they have a bunch of, like, horrific genetic... This is actually called an abomination, and this is meant to be, like, there's a prisoner trapped inside of it who's forced to fight. He's been melded with ants, which is why he's got six limbs, and he's all semi-insectile. Their basic infantry are called force-grown drones, and they're just, like, mindless slugs in bone armor that's been grown onto them. Um, most of their forces are purpose-grown clones, like combat slugs 
effectively, and the designs are very H.R. Geiger-esque. They have dwarves. They're called the Dwegham, I think is their name, for them, and I think Sphere could probably elaborate on that a wee little bit more. Thank you so much, by the way, for the reminder, Hamburg. And I don't know the full story with them. It's something like, it's the classic, and then the dwarves dug too deep, and they found the bad thing. And now they're all, like, infested with the spirit of war or something. So they're particularly over-the-top dwarves. Like, all the models have huge beards and wild hair, and they're super burly. And they have big, like, mechanical constructs with flame belching out of them. Like, they're really, really over-the-top. Um... One of the other factions available right now, the latest released faction, is called the Wahadrun. Wahadrun? Wahadrun? I don't know how you pronounce it. It's got an apostrophe in there somewhere. It starts with a W. Um, they're basically South American, like, Maya Incan inspired orcs. With, they have, like, you know, Braves or their primary infantry and such, and they've got, like, Slingers as their ranged infantry. But then the kicker is, they fucking ride dinosaurs. Which is it's so cool. It's so cool. Yeah, as Torx. There you go, WJ. They have, like, really sweet, like, Velociraptor riders. And um, <clears throat> the Velociraptors in particular are very, very, very cool. They're sort of the more modern interpretation of dinosaurs, where they've got, like, feathers, you know, for, for like, plumage, for a mane. They're, they're really neat models. Yeah, so much for elf rangers with bows. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the reason that I like the fact that the human models are so grounded is that all the other races are so off the wall, batshit crazy. It almost, like, you sort of need this point of contextualization, this little bit of familiarity within the universe to make sense of everything else. Because it would be one thing, it's one of the reasons I was not a huge fan of Age of Sigmar when it came out, is that it did away with, um, you know, the, 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 the Empire. It did away with the old Imperial human forces. And... It's not as exciting to me when you're like, there are giant chaos demons invading through portals. And I'm like, what do I have to fight them? And they're like, you have nine foot tall supermen with dicks that are like giant golden hammers and they fuck them out of existence. I'm like, uh, I get it. Everything's dialed up to 11, but it's just kind of like if everybody's special, nobody is. And... I, I like that the Hundred Kingdoms are so restrained in their design because it gives you a point to be like, where do I fit in in this universe? As a human being on the planet Earth, where do I fit in in this universe? And you can have an army of dudes that are just like guys in armor and they got a sword and they got a shield and we're like, we're in a big, we're, we're in a formation. You understand what we are. You understand our power level. And now we're going to fight that, that 20 foot tall ant monster over there. I agree, Project Dark Fox. What the fuck indeed? They're very, very cool. I need to get my damn affiliate code set up because if, if y'all are going to be buying into the game, I want to be able to save you that, that 10%. I just can't give it to you right now because, again, it is giving out my personal email and I don't, I don't want that to be the case either. But if you are interested in picking up the game, grabbing the core set, they have some great bundle deals. Uh, you can still save your 10% by going over to, like, Walter's Workshop and picking up his affiliate code. Or Spheres, there you go. There are affiliate codes all over the damn place. You in chat, please see this, by the way. Dino Riders Rulon Warriors Battle Pack. Oh, shit. Oh, that's like a whole set. What's up with the, the, the... Oh, there's like a rider cavity on the side. There's like a little command pod on the side of the big brontosaurus guy. There's like a little battle triceratops. There's a T-Rex with a gun turret on his back. What are these for? Harness the power of dinosaurs.
And they're just, they're just toys. It's not a game. There's no rule system. There's no board game to go with it. That seems like a missed opportunity, considering the detail of them. Oh, wow. And you can put different riders on them. There's a little Velociraptor with a missile launcher on him. Those are actually pretty cool figures. Particularly considering how many you apparently get for just $20. Hey, 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 Suicide Printy, how you doing today, my friend? Since you brought... I didn't bring up Dino Riders. I brought up the fact that some people ride dinosaurs, and then you brought up Dino Riders. You know, tomato, tomato. Yeah, I don't know if they're minis or toys. They look like they're just toys. They don't really seem like they have any eye on the miniature gaming or painting market at all. some mold line removal, but we're going to make it real quick and just focus on the, the most problematic areas for the most part. Because, baby, we building models today. Nostalgia is a huge market that is ripe for milking at the moment, too, if you'll forgive the, quite frankly, nauseating uh, phrasing on that. Nostalgia is what sells right now. It's like... <laughs> Like, my whole generation right now are, are the ones who... I don't want to say... We don't, we don't have all the money. We have very little of the money, but we have small disposable incomes, and there's a lot of us, and we're all like, Hey, the world sucks. Please return me to my childhood. And, and the market is like, we, we can handle that. We can sell your childhood back to you at a premium. You just give me your credit card number or, or your PayPal. What are you up to today, Suicide Printy? Anything good? Anything fun? Probably good. Usually good. But I wonder if it's fun. Went to a Comic and Toy Expo this weekend. Bought some old G.I. Joes. Nice. Were they classic figures or were they like reprints? Another sprue empty. One more. And then we'll sort through this. Oh, God. 80s, 90s, and modern. Nice. Good haul, then, I hope. I don't know, man. I wish that... I'm going to say I wish that I had had the, the sense to hold on to the toys that I had as a kid. But, you know, looking back on it and your capacity to make decisions at that point, what I wish is I wish that my parents had been had had any idea about the collector's market or hadn't been... I don't know, like, they, they, they don't have the same nostalgia for shit that I do, so I don't think they ever would have understood why I'd want to keep something like that. But I got encouraged over and over, like, any time we moved, and we moved a lot when I was young. It was always, well, we're having a garage we're having a garage sale. So it's time to sell everything. And I kind of just went with it because I was a kid. And they were like, oh, you'll get some money and you'll get rid of that old crap. And that old crap I was getting rid of were like Super Nintendo games and my old original N64. And I just like, uh, but I don't want to dwell on how irritating I find that I was encouraged to get rid of them. I'd rather just say that I wish I still had them because, oh man, I had such cool stuff. Now I have like, I have like almost nothing from my childhood anymore. You know, no use crying over spilt milk, I suppose, but, you know, come on. I didn't wish I hadn't given away my old Pokemon cards now. Yeah, see, Sphere, there was a time, like anything I had when I was a young teen, I managed to hold on to a few pieces from generally. I sold most of my Pokemon card collection. I kept a couple of sleeve pages worth of my favorites and the ones that, that were really rare. 
at the time, and I do still have those, and I'm glad about that. I've got some of the magic cards that I used to collect. Uh, I don't have, like, I, I have my, you can mark it, I have my Xbox, I have my original Xbox and most of my old Xbox games, but any system before the Xbox, I don't have anymore. It's, uh, you know, we all, we live and learn, and some of us just have adults in our lives who have the sense to go, hey, don't sell that, you're gonna want that someday. A lot of us apparently don't. Wish I had two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, and number seven, two number 45s, one with cheese and a large soda. I want a fucking, like, a 12 taco supreme pack. That's what I want. Keeping it simple. Regret selling your Robotech toys? Yeah, there's, there's plenty of regret to go around. With, with the people in this chat, and the sheer level of dorkery that, that we ultimately represent. I would be willing to bet that there is a great amount of man, I wish I'd kept that. There, There is certainly enough to go around. So let's all take a moment and mourn the toys that we no longer own. <sighs> Maybe we'll be wiser in the next life. You can always recoup all the toys that you had as a child. All you have to do is buy them from a wiser man at several hundred times what they were worth when you originally purchased them off of eBay. It's easy. <laughs> oh, Shavo 40 k thank you so much for the follow, my friend. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. How you doing today? Still have not painted... The dragon. You know, Bueno, I want you to do me a favor. You can say that to yourself, but try dropping still. Try dropping the word still from that. Drop the subtle implication of I should have done this before because you're just working on things in your own time, man. I still haven't done this, I still haven't done that. You know what? I keep working on stuff, and as long as I keep working on stuff, I eventually find my way back to the projects that I feel like I should be doing. You just gotta ride that passion. Sticker shock over the mass cartoon. Yeah, like they were so cheap when they were being marketed to us as kids. Not like, you know, pennies or anything. They were obviously trying to make money. But I remember my parents balking at the cost of some toys that I got when I was a kid. And I look at it now and I'm like, yeah, I can buy the same fucking toy for many, many times that. I thought the price was bad then. You have no idea. If you'd been smart, you would have recognized that eventually spending that money could have yielded a toy worth a great deal more. Not that I would have sold it, but they don't know that. Like Serpentor and Cobra La had modern Serpentor and old Cobra. Is that controversial? I feel like most of us at this point grew up with Serpentor to some degree. Like, the generation of G.I. Joe fans that came before the movie, before Serpentor was introduced, um, is, is I think, smaller than the generation of G.I. Joe fans who grew up with just Serpentor kind of always in the background someplace. Are these getting done in oils too, Spaztac? Yes. Yes, indeed they are. Which is why I'm doing a mass assembly today, because the idea is to unleash assembly line painting on them in oils over the next week or so. And see if we can't get a 600 point force done for Conquest so we can get some actual gaming in. This is the theory. I wouldn't I wouldn't pretend to be to have my finger on the pulse of the G.I. Joe fandom. All I can say is that I personally I never minded Serpentor that much. Again, I, I kinda grew up with him always around. Like by the time I was getting into G.I. Joe, like the G.I. Joe movie kinda already existed. Um the the Transformers movie like kinda already existed. So like that's that's that is my generation of fandom. And as such they just it's like, yeah, okay. Super science. He's got like a Khan Union Singh thing going on, but he's also a snake man. Whatever. Of 
currently rebuying all the RPG books I got rid of over the years. Oh my god. We should have like a like a communal moment of silence for all the very poor decisions we made growing up when we sold off all this shit. A whole generation before us kept telling us, you're gonna grow out of this, you're gonna grow out of this, one day you'll be a grown-up and you won't have time for any of this. And you know what? Uh, like, they were right in spirit. We don't really necessarily have time for all this shit, but what they were wrong is we didn't grow out of liking it, and as adults, we found ways to make time for it. They are the ones who didn't care enough about their own childhoods or any of this shit to make the time for it. To be fair, you grew out of most of it. I, you know, Tanks, I challenge that assertion. Many of us have probably grown out of most of it. I personally have not. <laughs> I've grown out of very little of it. Alright. Now to clean up these tiny pieces of plastic. Glue them together. Now, this is my one complaint, is that the men-at-arms figures have a very distinct raised edge along where the mold, where the mold line would be. And I wondered if it was meant to be there as part of the armor, but if that was their idea, it's kind of poorly implemented and I prefer it being smooth along this edge, so I just kind of scrape it out. It's not really hard to do. Styrene is such a nice easy to work with material that it really doesn't add much time to the processing. Terrible because the hipsters have driven the price of all the nerd stuff up. You know, yeah, that's that's this is the invisible hand of the free market. The invisible hand that climbs right up your ass and plays you like a fucking puppet. Yeah. Between the hipsters and then those of us who are genuinely just nostalgic for our own childhood, like, that shit is... It's just, you know, the demand is there, so it's worth money, so people are gonna charge what we're willing to pay for it, and... <sighs> Nostalgia sells right now. Nostalgia is very marketable, and I can complain about it, but I can't really fault the people making money on it. Just like I can complain about the, 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 the price of... Um, graphics of GPUs for the last while with fucking Ethereum until they quit their GPU mining and Bitcoin and blah 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 blah. I can, I can dislike the whole phenomenon that it's a part of and think that it's fucking stupid, but like the, the only people I can't fault in this are the people who have the GPUs, who got the GPUs and realize, wow, these are worth money. I'm gonna sell them to the people who want them more than I do. Like, I get it. I get it. Ooh, Hamburg, thank you for the reminder. Hey, Gus Schultz, good to see you. How you doing today? How's that How's that horrific Titan, Night Titan of yours coming along? Scalpers are still stampeding into Walmart and cleaning them out. Yeah, you know. I'm... I got a... 2060 Super... when it was relatively new, before everything really kicked off for the big nasty as far as the GPU scalpers go. And I'm just glad that I've been able to kind of coast along on that for a while, because I don't anticipate being able to get a new GPU for a while yet. Even once the demand is sort of petering out, the prices are still gonna stay high for a little while. Now I'm still waiting for the prices on webcams to come back down. At least that one made sense. At least that one was based on something real happening in the world, and not a bunch of random assholes out there going, We'll never need real money again! Unregulated currency is the best idea! It's not. It's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Uh, see, that's only a matter of time, nanotanks. I really just... Uh... I don't want to get into like a whole conversation on crypto because I know people have very strong opinions over it and some people build their whole personality around it. I personally think cryptocurrency is fucking stupid. 
Uh, it just over and over, what keeps happening with it is it develops a problem. It's insanely... Vo- it's just gambling. It's just gambling is all it is at this point. It's not a stable currency. It's never going to be a stable currency. And what people are going to discover, what they've been discovering over and over as problems crop up, they're like, it's almost like we need regulation on the currency market. Like, like we need some regulatory body or something. And it's like, oh, wow, wow. It's almost like humanity figured this out over the course of several thousand fucking years. And, and <laughs> Yeah. No! Unregulated is a good idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. Sure, okay, whatever. But again, that's not really a conversation that I want to get too deep into because a lot of people have a lot of opinions on it. And I would be the last to pretend that I am... I'm not an economist. I'm not qualified to really comment on the particulars of all of it. I just look at it, and overall, I roll my eyes at the concept. And and that's just me. And it annoys me that the headlong rush into crypto has affected normal PC consumers negatively the way that it has. And yeah, I get that, Terra Shard. The point of it is that it's unregulated. It's just my opinion that the lack of regulation is also the reason that it's never going to be anything. For Bitcoin to really become something, it's going to have to acquire regulation, at which point it will no longer serve a purpose. I mean, I can imagine a lot of things, Terra Shard. But this is just, this is just imagination. It's so damn volatile that you can't guarantee any of that's going to be true. I don't play the stock market either, and I know a lot of people would probably judge me for that. I just, I don't, I don't like gambling, and that's what it is. It's not what it's supposed to be, but functionally, that's, that's what it is. But then you shouldn't be taking your financial advice from me either. Like, let let me preface any commentary I have on this real quick. Don't take any financial advice from me. Let me extend that a little further. Don't take any financial advice from anyone on Twitch. (laughs) For the love of God, don't do it. It's a a shitty idea. (laughs) Bjorn Art, thank you so much for the follow, my friend. Welcome to the stream. Uh, you know what, Terra Shard, but that's the kind of thing where, like, yeah, if that happens, Bitcoin ain't gonna save you. Like, <laughs> if, if world markets collapse due to inflation, cryptocurrency is not gonna then be worth anything. It, it only has worth relative to regulated currency anyway. Nobody's ever gonna... Uh, okay, alright. Uh, this is a point where I'm like... I don't really have that much more meaningful commentary to offer on it. Uh, let's let's just suffice to say I don't believe any of that speculation. But if you do, then that that's awesome. Get you some Bitcoin, man. I'm not gonna. I won't even judge people who are into Bitcoin. You go for it. It only affects me in so far as I'd like a new GPU at some point. Though thankfully, a lot of the crypto mining is moving away from that, is my understanding. So, with any luck, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, if you listen to me on things, if you give a shit about what I think about anything, which I can't tell why you would do that, but let's assume for a moment that you do, I personally don't buy into cryptocurrency being anything more than a fucking pipe dream. But that's me. Me? You know what I am? Call me whatever you want, but I am all in on civilization, my friend. If the world governments and the world economy collapses, you know what? I'm gonna suffer, and I recognize that. That's just life. I never really had a choice in the matter anyway. Gold isn't the best alternative. No, I I don't don't think hoarding gold is a great idea either. The problem you're gonna run into is that I just have no stock in the future. How do you feel about that new MODOK show? I haven't watched it. 
Riot Sister. Has anybody watched the new Modoc show? Man, Ruff Asal, welcome in. It's good to see you, my friend. CWJ, that's true, but that's how all of civilization currently runs. Like, once we get into that conversation about what money is backed up by, we're talking about like post apocalyptic scenarios where suddenly what your money is backed up by has intrinsic value. And I'm like, we're talking about a collapse on such a widespread level that none of these things really concern me at that point. Like,. But by the time we're at that level, I'm thinking like, you know what I do have? I have a whole lot of bullets, and that's going to be worth something, too. But again, don't take financial advice from me. Like, at all. Don't do it. I'm betting on civilization working and markets not totally fucking me. And it's entirely possible that I'm just a stupid man. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's where we're at where I'm at, anyway. That, and I mean, I don't have kids. I'm not, I'm not trying to protect literally anything after my death. I'm rolling the dice, baby. I'm making the big bet. You know what my bet is? You know what my gamble is? That the world won't collapse before I die of other causes. <laughs> if we can just hold on until the Grim Reaper comes for me, then y'all y'all do whatever you want after that. I don't give a shit. Welcome to Nihilism with Thunderhead. Wasn't a huge fan of Beyond Earth. I haven't seen... Uh, wait, Beyond Earth? What's Beyond... Oh, oh, you're talking about civilization. Oh, okay, I don't think I... I played Civilization Beyond Earth briefly, and it's sucked, as I recall. It's been long enough that I... I feel bad saying it sucked without being able to say it sucked for these reasons. I remember that the affinity system was terrible to Square. Thank you for the reminder. Ugh. I remember the, the affinity system frustrating me in the extreme. I remember the game being very, very simplistic. I only played it for a little while, and I was like, I don't enjoy this, and I dropped it. But I will say, Terra Shard, I appreciate your position, and uh, I, I don't want you to get the feeling that I'm saying, like, you're a dumbass with your crypto. Uh, if you should take anything from this conversation, it's me throwing my hands in the air and going, I don't fucking know, I just want a GPU. Like, that's the extent of my position on it, for the most part. I am not a financial advisor. <laughs> I should not be con- I'm not a financial advisor, I just play one on TV, except I don't even do that. <laughs> How you doing, Datron? Uh, I'm trying to remember a civilization beyond Earth. I remember that it had an affinity system that didn't make any damn sense. It restricted the way that I wanted to play. I'm trying to remember what else was bad about it, but again, I only played it a few times, and then I went back to playing, like, Stellaris. I'm like, ah, I'm done with this shit. My financial advice is to buy and play new games. You know what I always think of when I think of the global economic collapse, the inevitable collapse of human civilization? I always think of... Do you remember the suicide drug in, in Children of Men? Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you remember the one that Michael Caine was after where it was like, Quietus, you decide when. I just wonder if I'm going to be around at the time when self-euthanasia becomes fashionable. When, it's, when people look around and they're like, ah, eh, what's the point? <laughs> oh, I'll laugh. I'll laugh when that day comes. Because, again, I have no stock in the future. Not really. This is a depressing subject, which is why I don't really talk about it that much. Let's just say that my outlook on everything for the future is pretty depressing. Which is why I spend most of my time painting little plastic mans and, and having fantasy game battles. Because I'm determined to enjoy the here and the now. Can't buy any more minis until I'm done painting what I have. 
<laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's a good one, Terra Shard. I almost thought you were serious for a second. laying out all these parts up here in a nice organized way so that we can go through an assembly line construction real quick like. Damn it, all the MCP gets painted. I'm treating myself to a conquest starter. There you go. Treat yourself. Hey, pun expected. Good to see you. I'm sorry, Pity. I don't mean to talk about depressing things. Roland, I'm going to be busting out some of my heavy gears this next week, by the way. I think that's what we're going to be doing on Thursday. we got to do Warcaster Tuesday, but I'm thinking Thursday we're going to do some heavy gear blitz. You know, the thing is, Roland, that there's nothing wrong with that, and you shouldn't, like... I think that you only have things to gain, and I realize this isn't this is not the line of someone trying to sell the game to anybody. You have nothing but gain. No, nothing but the potential for gain in, in putting it off. Because I look at Conquest and I see a game that doesn't necessarily need that much help growing. It's picking up in a lot of different places, a lot of people are starting it, it's gaining a lot of momentum, and it's gaining a lot of momentum rolling into a season when conventions and tournaments are gonna be starting up again. I think that Conquest has a lot of momentum behind it, and I think that that's going to carry it forward for a while. So you only can benefit from waiting, honestly. There will be, by the time you get in, better and more models. You're not going to miss anything, is what I'm saying. And more people playing, from the look of things. It has, it has really taken off in a big way. all this style of leg. I'm gonna do a quick organizational pass here. Put all the torsos in one area. All the sword arms in one area. All the heads over here, minus the one that I dropped earlier, because obviously I'm so good at what I do. them out more specifically as we clean them up. All the shield arms over here. More torsos, more shield arms. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of men at arms. Arms of men, as it were. Alright, there we go. On to clean. After I finish painting the APC from Aliens, gonna start your ships for Armada. Nice! Is that uh, the. the new Mantic system Armada that you're talking about, Lunchbox? I find that one very. Interesting. I, I haven't really dug into it. I know that it's sold out very quickly when they released the first few boxes, so I was kind of like, well, that's fine. I'll just wait and, and see how it goes. I like the designs for it, though. And I really enjoy fleet battle games. Have two tigers found leftovers from your last time. I'll take any hit, any gears that you don't want, Roland. I'm not going to turn them down. If that's what's being offered. Hard to get people to pick up a new minis game because they're so invested in the current games. Yeah, Terra Shard. It's, minis games are... I have championed a number of games when they first showed up. 
I have sort of reached into the wet clay of the local gaming community on a number of occasions and pulled out of it a community a few times. I did it in San Antonio for Beyond the Gates of Antares from Warlord Games. Um, and I'm not uh, like, a, 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 we, it did work in these cases that I mentioned. Like, we pulled it off. For Beyond the Gates of Antares, we had about 15 people playing two to three times a week regularly. Like, this this to me is a successful attempt to sort of get a community started. Um, I've got a real talent for picking losers, though, because Beyond the Gates of Antares, like, it didn't, in my opinion, get the support that it needed. Uh, they did a few expansions for it, but they, like, the first expansion was really good, and then the second expansion was, like, about some crazy bug drones or something, and then the third expansion was about some other kind of crazy drone. It's like they just lost momentum on, on that one. I did it for a number of Star Wars games that were more successful. We did Star Wars Armada, uh, Imperial Assault locally. We got a good community going for, um... Star Wars Legion, when it first got started, I was one of the big pushers for that in San Antonio. And then FFG's game, Rune Wars, the miniatures game. That was probably the last one that I really tried to push. Uh, that We had success with that one, too. We had a really, really good gaming community playing Rune Wars in San Antonio. And then FFG one day was like, oh, we're not making this game anymore, fuck you. And that made me so sad. Like, we were in the middle of playtesting a new expansion for it, which I still don't think I'm, like, legally allowed to tell you what it was we were testing for the wave of Rune Wars that will never be released because it's a dead game. <sighs> they were cool, though. They were cool. Conquest, and, and since then I've been a little bit nervous about getting into new systems just because I've been burned so many times, but Conquest has been picking up steam all on its own and I haven't had to push it. And that, to me, is at least mildly inspirational. Test of Honor was that way for... Yeah, t Test of Honor... Like, I didn't push that one locally, but Test of Honor had a good... Like, it had a lot of steam coming out of the gate and then it just... It faltered. I still have some of my old Test of Honor minis that I did when that released. Also, that was Warlord, like, making use of some really old sprue molds that they still had access to. Which, you know, good on them. I'll bet they saved a lot of money. No good places to eat around San Antonio. Uh, yes. Have you been to Mi Tierra? Have you been to Chris Madrid's? Have you been to... Was it, it wasn't Chester's. There's another burger place that's on 1604 that was really badass. Hey, 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 amateur paint hour. Welcome in. No and no. WJ, go to Chris Mad If you want burgers, go to Chris Madrid's. If you would like Mexican food, literally any time. I'm talking 24 hours a day. Go to Mi Tierra. It's in the sort of western uh, market region. I, I can't remember what street it's on, but if you look up Meteora San Antonio, you'll find it. It's very, very famous. But they're open 24 hours a day. I love that place. Bomb and Mexican food. They have, the, they have the best bar. They have the best bar. You go in there, and it's like this old wood, hand-carved, like, antique bar with this huge, like, columns going up on either side and this huge, like, you know, the eagle and the Mexican flag. You know, it's got, like, a snake and shit. Like, it has that all hand-carved in wood above the bar and they have so many types of tequila it'll blow your damn mind but yeah they're open 24 hours a day we used to love that because we'd go down to like the white rabbit or whatever for a show we'd go see like guar or the revolting cox or whatever whatever was going on at the time i think we saw the reverend horton heat there and we'd get out at like you know 3 a.m and you could still roll down to me Tierra and order anything off their menu that you wanted Oh man, I miss that place so much. There is a bomb-ass Chinese place on the northeast side of San Antonio called Hong Kong Island. It's just this little hole in the wall with a super generic name in like a strip mall next to, I think, a family dentist. It's so good. I, I hope... You know what you could do for me? See if they're still there. Because the last time I, uh... 
the last time I ate there was a couple years ago, and it was, it was pre-pandemic, and I just... I, I, I haven't looked lately to see if they still exist as a business, but I hope that they're still there, because the people who run it were fucking awesome and their food was amazing. But so many small businesses died over the course of the pandemic, so they might not still be there. Meteor is definitely still there. They're an institution. Meteor has been there for like a hundred years or something. In one form or another. Darth Brooks. <laughs> You're welcome, Hamburger. If it's any consolation, I'm hungry, too. Now, now that I've been talking about food. Also, you know, what's the place called? Chacho's? There's a chain in San Antonio called Chacho's that's, like, a few of their locations are really quite seedy. Like, the one that was near where I used to live, I remember somebody got shot in the drive-thru. <laughs> like, it was in the newspapers, like, some dude got, like, it was like gang violence in the drive-thru, which is really seedy. And um, I love their tacos so much that I waited like a week, and then I went back to the same drive-thru where somebody got shot, and I was just like, I'm rolling the dice, universe. They probably won't shoot me, I just want to buy some tacos. Well, clearly they ordered the wrong thing, Terra Show. Hong Kong Island is still open, is it really, WJ? That's wonderful. If you're in the area and you're looking for some Chinese food and you felt like patronizing them, like, please do, because they're fucking fantastic. The Mongolian beef they have there is just, it is, it is tits. It is amazing. Looking for a resin printer between 300 and 400 bucks. You can do better than that, SpazTech. I just got the Elegoo Mars 2 for $200 on Amazon with, I think it's normally like 235 240 something like that. They had a coupon so you could knock $35 off of it, so I got it for $200. I love it. I love the Elegoo Mars 2. It's a little bit, it has a larger print area than the Mars 1. Uh, it prints faster than the Mars 1. It's super easy to set up. It, it's a wonderful machine. If you're just getting into 3D printing, I highly recommend it. It's well-priced, too. Don't get the Pro. You're going to look at the two, and you're going to go, there's the Mars 2, and there's the 2 Pro, and the 2 Pro isn't that much more. The features on the 2 Pro are not that great. Like, I don't think they're worth the extra money, like, at all. The 2 is just fine. Got hobby knives for a dollar each at the craft store. They don't last long. Are there better ones I should be buying? So, Terra Shard... The, the essential hobby knife has two parts. It's a handle and a blade. This handle... Wow. This handle is a Gale Force 9 handle that I purchased in 2005. In Monterey, California, at the only shop in town that sold Warhammer 40k figures. And it is, it is cheap as fucking dirt. It's super duper basic. It's all worn down. It is a cheap plastic tube. Like, this is this is nothing. Uh, the, 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 the part that you want to pay attention to are the blades. I like Tecna Edge. I buy the Tecna Edge number 11 hobby blades in these 100 packs periodically. I just get them on Amazon or if you have it, if you have like a local uh, store, like a hobby store that sells like Evergreen and stuff like that, you can usually find Tecna Edge blades there. But yeah, get these 100 packs of the Tecna Edge number 11s. They're my favorite. Also, I can highly recommend Oh god, what brand is it? I don't think these ones are Tecna Edge. These curved blades. But I use this one quite a lot. These curved hobby blades. Um. Hmm. Do I have? Where? How can I? How can I find out what brand it is that I've been ordering? Hang on. Let me see. It's not Army Painter. These are absolutely not Army Painter brand blades. They're not testers. They're. Hang on. Just give me a second here. Let me check. Since they don't have a bunch of paint out or anything, I can pull up a browser and take a look. Yeah, I've got to work out my streaming station that acts so that accessing a browser is not as much of a pain. But I think an overall overhaul of the streaming station is in order. No, it is from Techna Edge. No, I was mistaken. Yeah, okay. Okay. 
So these curved blades, which I've got myself a, an actual Exacto brand handle for these ones. These are the number 28 hobby blade from Techna Edge. This curve is so unbelievably useful for mold line removal, for cutting through plastics, like just get a set of five of these. They're a little bit more expensive than your standard hobby blade. Again, this is the number 28. Get yourself one five pack of these and a handle that uses them and fucking tell me that you don't love these blades. The uses will become apparent almost immediately. What beer are we drinking today, uh, Air Flex? I just got myself a 24 pack of Stella the other day. They're really, really good. I started using them uh, because mostly for mold line removal. And they work better than. Because I know that like Games Workshop a little while ago started selling their own mold line remover. And honestly, those blades work way, way... Why, like, why am I not using it right now? It's actually really good for this. I just realized I should actually be using it as we speak. Well, you know, I can think or I can stream. I can't do both. She's asking a lot. The curve can kind of help you not... Like, sometimes when you scrape across styrene, you'll wind up, like building a facet, you know, flattening an area really nasty so that you have this nice curve and then a flat. Um, scraping with this leaves a slight curve to it, so you go over it a few times like this, and you won't have those nasty flats to deal with when you go to paint it. The other thing it's really good for is, like, here where I've got to cut these off, because it's curved, you just kind of, you do like a sawing or a slicing motion and the curved blade sort of pushes its way through without you having to pull the blade towards yourself or anything like that and thus cut your goddamn finger off. Handles generic for all blades. There are different sizes of handle, Terra Shard. Uh, this is an Exacto brand handle and it is larger because these number 28 blades are larger than the number 11. Like you can see here, it is physically like the shank is a little bit larger. Yeah, they're not really proprietary. They are built to standard sizes. Yeah, usually there's like a small and a large. You're not going to find too many outside of that. What you drinking, Airflex? Still use the Exacto handle you bought in 88. The only thing that can be bad is the handle is the groove for the blade is off center. Otherwise, it's just a matter of size. Yeah, like again, this is a cheap piece of shit Gale Force 9 handle that I bought in 2005 from a hobby store in Monterey, California when I was just kind of getting back into Warhammer 40k with the release of like I think 5th edition came out around that time. I still have my my 5th edition limited edition only 4,000, 4,000, 2,000 only 2,000 or 4,000 were made what's the difference? 5th um, edition rule book with the leather bound cover that you open up and there's like a nice resin purity seal inside and everything worth dick now, but I have it. That's not true. I think it's worth a little... I think you... I think last time I checked on eBay, you could sell them for like 200 bucks or something. But, you know, 200 bucks ain't worth the memories. Ah, the memories, like when I convinced one of my hard-charging infantry NCOs to pick up Warhammer 40k. He was this real, like, I'm no nerd, I like sports kind of guy. And it was funny, because I sat there building Space Marines over and over on CQ, which we were sitting together for months. And, uh... Is 17, backs, 17 bucks for a handle overkill? Uh, that seems a bit high. That does seem a little bit high. I probably wouldn't go over like five to ten dollars for a handle, but I haven't bought a new handle in a while, so I don't want to be like, oh, there's no handle out there that's worth that much. Maybe there is, I don't know. 
I think this one was maybe $10. And, you know, consider, too, that in this purchase, you're going to have to... Ideally, you'll just buy the one, maybe two, and then you'll use the same one for over a decade. So, you know, factor that in. Yeah, that, that's exactly right, Nanotanks. Like, you, you'll be using this, a good one, for at least a decade. So, it's not... I don't want to say don't spend money on a good one. I just want to say make sure you're getting features that you actually want. Even a cheap one. Again, this one was super cheap and it sucks. And I just keep using it because it keeps working. But yeah, I got him into, into Warhammer 40k. He knew nothing about it, but I sat there day after day on CQ, working on 40k models, building space marines, and it started off with him just, like, being, you know, his his usual, oh, I'm gonna make fun of your nerd shit self. Day by day, he learned more facts about space marines and got more interested in the setting. Day by day, his jokes turned more into genuine interest, and then one day, he's asking me where I buy the models. And then, oh ho ho then, Mr. Hardcore Combat Arms, well... He built an entire table of 40k terrain out of nothing but like foam and popsicle sticks and I gotta tell you it was one of the coolest tables I ever played on. He made his whole own Black Templar army, he did all his own custom conversions, he wrote 40k fanfic for his creative writing class. Oh man. And then he disappeared. He, he's one of my, my army buddies who, uh, like, went completely no social media, totally off-grid when he got out. And he... I've tried to track him down a few times. He's just, like... I think he moved to Montana. He got a boat. He got a good job. He lives with his family. And he just doesn't want to hear from anybody, so... He doesn't. But I want to tell you... I want to tell you, Joshua Kryloss, if you're out there... I miss you, man. I'd love to roll some dice again someday. Uh, 40k has a real mass appeal now, too. Like, it, it was having... arguably a harder time finding a toehold with a lot of people in the early 2000s, but from, like, 20... like, around 2010, 40k suddenly became cool. And now it's, like, perfectly socially acceptable to be into it, so everybody is. Which is good. Back in 06, 08, ooh, hardcore boys, then. Yeah, a lot of them are, you know, it's, uh, military guys are kind of suckers for, like, pulp military fiction most of the time, and 40k lives in pulp military fiction at its heart. And you're like, hey, read this book real quick, and it's all about a giant guy with a rocket gun blowing up aliens, and they're like, this is, this is actually this is pretty cool. Okay, yeah, I'll read this. I feel you on that one, Terra Shard. I feel you. You know, that I struggle with that feeling. That... A lot of people get accused of being, like, gatekeepers when we bring that sort of thing up. But I think it's a valid feeling that should be talked about. I've talked about it a few times here on stream. Like, I like, I think Star Wars is one of the most, the easiest examples to point out. But I think it applies to a lot of fandoms. Where there are those of us who are in a generation where when we were in school, you know, public, public school, when we were in middle school, high school, etc. We were into these things, but these things were not at all popular. And thus it was very, very easy to pick on us for being into these things. And oh my god, did it ever happen. Oh my god, did it ever happen. And, you know, we grow up and we retain our fandoms and we're fans of the things that we are. And in, in a way, our generation, a generation above me and, and, and our generation, kind of blazed the trail for that to be more socially acceptable. Like, we put it in more people's faces and we said, no, actually, it's really cool. And eventually, you know pop culture catches up, and, and the marketers get a hold of it, and then Disney happens, and, you know, kids growing up today, not to sound like an old man, but kids growing up today, they can just be fans of these things. 
In fact, it's sort of the default to be fans of it now. It's not like a, a niche nerd thing anymore. It's more like, you're not a fan of Star Wars? What the fuck is wrong with you? And it's, it's weird. It is, it is weird for those of us who had to suffer somewhat in order to be fans of things. And I, again, people get accused of gatekeeping when they bring this one up, because it's like, you didn't have to suffer like I did. That's not what I'm saying. It's true, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. We all want our... I think this is a good discussion on the human condition. We all suffer. All of us suffer through something at some point. Warrior Shade 11, for instance, is currently suffering through watching this stream. Thank you so much for the follow, by the way. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. And we all want our suffering to mean something, I think is what it comes down to. We want to believe that we suffered for a reason or that our suffering had meaning, but I think that there is a cold, hard truth we all need to accept at the end of the day, and that's that suffering in and of itself has no meaning. You didn't necessarily suffer for a reason. You just suffered because you, you weren't into the cool toys at the time, and now the toys are cool, and now other people aren't gonna. And it can be frustrating to have people claiming ownership of a property without ever having really had it be a negative aspect of their life. But it's good, ultimately, is what I just remind myself of. Like, I... Nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit that I'm like, Ugh, people used to make fun of me when I read my Star Wars books in school. Nobody gives a shit. We should just be happy that the new generation, that the 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 youngins these days can just love these things and not have the bullshit social pressures heaped on them as a result. This is a good thing. It's a frustrating thing sometimes because we did suffer for no fucking reason, but we're not going to impose reason on it by making them feel weird about liking new things, you know? We're just going to seem old and out of touch, which arguably we are. d and is another good example, Terror Shard. What do you call a ghost T? Uh-oh. Uh oh. What do you call it, Warrior Shade? Just happy when I see the torches passed on to the next generation. Yeah, I'm with you, Just a Car. It's it's hard. You know, ultimately, this is kind of a conversation about just getting old and and how it's hard to accept that linear time works the way that it does. But it does, and no amount of complaining about it is going to make it stop. Time moves on, and. You just have to be thankful for the good times that you had. It's why I've more or less left Star Wars behind as a property these days, and I've sort of accepted, like, you know, the new movies, the new shows, the new whatever, they're not ruining anything. My childhood was my childhood, and I enjoyed everything that I enjoyed just as much as I always did, and you can't really take that away from me. It's just different now. It's being marketed to different people. It's not, it's not being made for me, and that's fine. I don't own it. Am I really to square? More so than usual? Someone was a fan of a thing, got made fun of for being different, became popular, same with computer guys. Yeah, no, that's 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 just it, Datron Voltari. And that's, like, I use Star Wars as an example, but this applies to everything. Don't get me wrong, I'm still going to complain about it. See this more as a disclaimer so that you know, as I complain about these things, I recognize that my complaining is meaningless. Like, for instance, Rogue One is a bad movie, and you should feel bad for liking it. Though at the same time, I'm glad that it exists, and I'm glad people like it. Complaining doesn't make it stop, but it feels good. There we go. As long as we recognize that we're just indulging the pettiest parts of ourselves, And you know there's nothing wrong with that either. I do like Solo. Solo was a fun movie. Rogue One was not a fun movie. But see, that's just it. At a certain point, I had to realize, growing up, that the criteria that I use to call something good, or the criteria that makes me enjoy a thing, is not the same as everybody else. And you know, that's a funny thing that has come with the advent of the internet. Back in the day, when fan forums were few and far between, and there were things like fan clubs, and you had to mail in to get your fucking decoder ring, there was a tendency to assume that everybody who was into the same things you were into was into it for the same reasons that you, that you were into it. But that's never been true. We've always been different people, 
with different thoughts and feelings and likes and reasons for liking the things that we did. And social media and the internet hasn't changed that, I don't think. It's just made us more aware of it. Like, we can love the same thing for completely different reasons. We just didn't know it so clearly before. Some things are objectively bad or poorly made, and saying so these days is somehow wrong, and it's a uh, bad aka toxic, or the phobe, or an ism, or something. It's bad, so, you know, I feel like that's always been true to a degree, though. Again, I, I feel like there's a tendency these days to say that social media has done this to us. To say, oh, pop culture has done this to us. Uh, Disney has done it. Whoever. I don't think it's true. I think it's just, it's it's maybe amplified it a little bit. It's maybe made it so that we couldn't ignore it, but it's always been true. Non-Star Wars fans liked Rogue One. You know, I agree with you, Terror Shard, but a lot of genuine Star Wars fans liked it too. It's just people who like different aspects of Star Wars than I did. People who always wanted Star Wars to be different, which, I mean, okay. Can't really say they're wrong. I just, it's not what I want, that's all. I liked Solo because it was just like, here's an adventure. So let's go on an adventure. And then we've got Zombie Breath Studios, whose opinions are constantly terrible and he's wrong about everything. So, you know, as I sit here saying no one's really wrong, I suppose the exception proves the rule. Congratulations, Zombie Brush. Star Wars Christmas is a fucking abomination. That's one of those where, like, I like bad movies. <laughs> like, I like bad movies because they're bad, in many cases. I can find entertainment in things that are not necessarily very entertaining. And there's a tendency to think, like, oh, everyone should watch the Star Wars Christmas special, oh, just so you know what you're talking about. I don't think that's true. The Star Wars Christmas special is fucking nonsense. It, it's a, it's, it is a, a relic. It is a fucking dinosaur of this, this confused production where people were like, what is Star Wars? Why do people want this? How do we market this? I don't know. Make a variety show and put B. Arthur in it. Like, eh, no. <laughs> Please don't do that. I, I don't know who the Star Wars Christmas special was designed to appeal to, but it ultimately succeeded in appealing to nobody. And not even in a fun way. Like, it's painful to watch. I'm just saying, like, George Lucas doesn't regret Attack of the Clones, but George Lucas does regret the Star Wars Christmas special. This should tell you something. It was marketed at Children, Carrie, and Lich, but do you remember... Okay, here's a question. Do you remember the scene... Do you remember the scene, Carrie and Lich, where... Lumpy? Scratchy? Smelly? Who was the exactly Datron Voltari? There is this super uncomfortable scene where Grandpa Wookie, Scratchy, or whatever the fuck his name is, buys a virtual reality helmet from some intergalactic huckster... Lumpy. Yeah, that's, le that's legitimately his name. And he puts on the virtual reality helmet, and it, it's basically just porn. Like, it, it's... Who, who is that? Who, who is the artist who's in that scene? Who's in the hologram? She's like, I am your fantasy. I am your desire. I am ecstasy. And it's like, what? Is Grandpa Chewbacca? Is Lumpbacca in the living room? Like, just beaten off to VR Star Wars porn? How does that appeal to children? How does a variety show where B. Arthur sings a song at the Moss Eisley Cantina appeal to children? I... <laughs> Carrie and Lich, no, because you don't care about Star Wars. You just drop that like a bomb. You're just, you're just, you're just trolling. I see how it is. Don't watch the Star Wars Christmas special. It's not, it's not good. It's not endearing. I would recommend you watch the cartoon Star Wars Droids before you watch the Star Wars Christmas special. Star Wars Droids has more redeeming factors to it than the Christmas special. And it's not a good show either. Yeah, strange noises. Yeah, that's what they are, WJ. They're not him climaxing in the middle of the living room with his grandchild nearby. Certainly not that. I, 
I agree with you mostly, Carrion Lich. Uh, these days, I'm of the opinion that there are a couple of Star Wars movies that are good. Truly good. I think that Star Wars A New Hope, the first movie, is a pretty okay movie. Like, as far as writing, as far as the script and the concept goes, it's okay. It's the execution that elevates that movie above its ilk, above all the other movies coming around at, at the same time. Um, oh, thank you so much for the reminder, Discord. It, it's the production of it that elevates it, though. It, it's the involvement of Industrial Light and Magic. It is the involvement of John Williams. It's the involvement of Steven Spielberg. It's this sort of perfect storm of talent and actors who were right at this amazing point of their career. Your, your Carrie Fishers, your, um, you know, a Peter Cushing, who's like, yeah, sure, I'll be in this fucking movie. Alec Guinness, who famously had no time for the movie at all. He was like, yeah, I'll be in this piece of shit. Alec Guinness viewed it as like the downfall of his career that he was going to be in the movie. And uh, he was in it anyway. He had no way of knowing that what he regarded as a shitty performance that he didn't want to do would be regarded as, as, as one of the most influential science fiction performances in history, or craft a character that would be beloved all the way through to today. And, and it, was, it was a good movie. Again, not necessarily because of the amazing writing or even the incredible concepts. It was just this this perfect storm of, of talent and ideas and, and timing. And it all just worked. And then Empire happened. And Empire Strikes Back is a great movie. Empire Strikes Back is really good. Empire Strikes Back, you know, you got Lawrence Kasdan in there. Again, you got John Williams, but he's like coming off of the success of the first movie. And... Oh, he shined in that. I think Empire Strikes Back is the peak of that era of Star Wars. And Return of the Jedi has problems. Return of the Jedi was capitalizing on the success of the other two, and it has good parts, but it also has, you know, the Ewoks. Um, it also has no idea of what to do with Princess Leia as a character. Like, Leia is really cool for the first 20 to 30 minutes of Return of the Jedi, and then she's like, I guess I'm still in this movie. It, she goes off and she, like, becomes a rebel ground soldier or something, and she kind of follows Han Solo. Like, Han Solo has nothing to do for the rest of the movie either. You could have inserted almost any two characters in the role that Han Solo and Princess Leia performed for the rest of the film, and it would have made no difference. They could have been just some random rebels. And this still would have been the same movie. They had nothing to offer character-wise. But then you also, at the same time, get Luke's arc with Vader and the Emperor. And that's great. That's really good. Yeah, Daytron, I tend to agree. Uh, the Nemoidians. Oh, the Gungans. Oh, no. You know what's funny is that it's not even like the concept of Jar Jar Binks doesn't work. It's the execution, again. Because Jar Jar Binks is in the Clone Wars cartoon. And I'm going to tell you, he's actually pretty funny. In the context of the Clone Wars cartoon and in the episodes that he is featured in, I found him not only inoffensive, but fairly entertaining. But it's because much better writers were working with him and were ultimately trying to make up for the failings of George Lucas's... I don't want to call Jar Jar Binks's realization racist because I feel like that would require there to be... Like, I don't, I don't think it was directed that way. I think it's just bad. It's just a terrible caricature of not even really anybody, just... He's just stupid. Like, his whole race is stupid. Ewoks would have worked better if they had two short scenes. Rebels airdropping a bunch of rifles and a short scene with the Ewoks and Rebels training each other. I would have been more okay with that than what they did. His wife that saved... Yeah, yeah, the famous editing by... I can't remember her first name, but yeah, George Lucas's wife at the time. This, is, this has been going around a lot lately. 
as a fairly well-substantiated rumor, and I think it's very interesting. George Lucas, he's a great big picture guy. Like, he really is, as far as just coming up with, hey, here's an idea and we should run with it. Like, he's got some good ones in his head. But when you ask him to do something like, hey, George, write some dialogue that two human beings would say to each other ever, he's like, oh... Oh, I, I don't know any people. <laughs> Thought The Last Jedi was good, but Ray really had no reason other than the plot not to roll with the full subverting expectations thing and join Ben. Yeah. Uh, I could go on about The Last Jedi for a long time. It's such a mixed bag for me. Overall bad, but not everything in The Last Jedi was bad. But the things that could have been good in The Last Jedi were dragged down into the mud by the things that were overwhelmingly stupid. I liked The Force Awakens. I realize that it's very po popular to just say, oh, the sequels are just bad. And they are, they're bad. But I do like to analyze things a little. When, when I dislike something, and, and by now, if you've been hanging out in the stream for a while, you know this, I analyze the things that I dislike quite a lot. Because I want to know why I dislike them. I want to understand. I don't like to just say, this is bad. And, and not be able to explain what it is about it that I think is bad. And in my analysis, sometimes I find that I have been unfair to films. Sometimes in my analysis, I find that I thought something was bad for mostly personal reasons, and it's not actually bad, I just don't like it. And I think it's important to recognize the difference between those two things. There are lots of things in this world that are good and I don't like. There are movies out there that are objectively well-crafted, culturally important pieces of cinema that I don't really like. And that's fine. But I'm not going to call them bad. Um, the Last Jedi is is bad, and it's bad because I don't think it understands at all what it's. It's bad for like a number of reasons. One of the reasons that it's bad is that it is a film at war with the film that it is a sequel to, which is maybe this is something that we could look into. If, if, do any of you out there know another example of this? Because I can't think of another example of a sequel to a movie as part of a trilogy, okay, that actively tried to undo the film that came before it. Highlander 3, maybe? Kind of, but still not to this degree. Certainly never on this, this scale. Because The Force Awakens was fine, and then The Last Jedi was like, fuck you. <laughs> It, like, it actively took the things that were set up in The Force Awakens and was like, no, we're not going to do that because I hate you. Like, it was rubbing your nose in the fact that you enjoyed the previous movie and that it didn't want to be that. Terminator 3? Mm. Okay. Okay. I'll accept Terminator 3 because it pissed in the eye of the whole no fate but what we make concept. Because I, I really, really loved the idea in, you know, Terminator and Terminator 2. There is no fate but what we make. The future is not set. And then Terminator 3 was like, lol, no, it is, fuck you. The future's totally set and there's nothing you can do about it, so, you know. Was that, like, the last thing that Claire Danes did? She did something after that, didn't she? I just, I just don't know what it is. They never made a Terminator after 2. I like the way you think, Carrie and Lich. Claire Danes did Homeland. Okay, I never watched that. The only part you take exception to saying The Force Awakens was okay, but other Daytron, okay. All right, you know what? Let's get into it. Let's get into it, Daytron. What about The Force Awakens was bad? Like, like really, what about The Force Awakens was bad? I'm not talking about unoriginal, because Star Wars is unoriginal. I'm not talking about... Uh, see, I don't even think she was in that movie, though, Daytron. I, I, I did not see her as being that bad of one in that movie. It, it, like, that's the thing. The Force Awakens set a lot of things up, and it certainly set Rey up in a way that she could have gone one of a number of directions. And unfortunately, the direction that they went was, oh, she's amazing at everything. But it didn't necessarily have to do that after the first movie. 
Like, the signs were there, the foundation was laid, yes, okay, fine. But they weren't fully committed to it yet. Just like they weren't fully committed to a lot of things. It was the point at which Ryan Johnson fully committed to a bunch of bullshit that everything went off the rails for me. Oh, I hate Star Trek Into Darkness to Square, but I don't feel like that was at odds with the first Star Trek 2009 movie either. I was okay with that, Datron, because the heroes of, of the first trilogy were legends at that point. I can buy that she grew up on stories of Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon. And okay, you know what, I'll even accept, uh, I'll, I'll accept for the sake of argument, even though I don't agree, that Rey's character in The Force Awakens was bad. Okay, fine. But there were so many good things, too. I think that, that Kylo Ren is a fantastic character. I think that, that Adam Driver's performance is certainly a big part of that, but he was also compellingly written for even the first two movies. I didn't have any problem with almost anything that Kylo Ren did in the second movie, except towards the end when he was like, ah, uh, I'm not actually going to be interesting. I know you thought I was going to be interesting, but I decided not to be. Adam Driver was phenomenal. I thought, uh, I actually liked Han Solo's inclusion in the first movie. I like that we catch up to Han Solo kind of at the end of his functional career. Like, everything's catching up with him in The Force Awakens. Everything's catching up with him. All the bad deals that he's made, all the people that he's screwed over, all the, the, the hijinks that he's pulled. He can't weasel out of them anymore. They've all caught up with him. He's old. He's tired. There's nothing left for him. And he kind of had to go in a, in a new direction. Now, yes, The Force Awakens was essentially a remake of A New Hope, but I don't consider that a bad thing. I agree with you there, Spaz Tech. Yeah, J.J. Abrams is a fucking hack, and he totally set up a bunch of stuff with his mystery box bullshit. And But again, like that wasn't a problem until later on when it didn't pay off. If the mystery box had been eventually opened and paid off, like there's nothing wrong with it. The problem is when there's nothing inside of it. Kylo Ren was a terrible villain, but see, that's just it, Spaz Tech. I never saw him as a villain. And I think making him the villain would have been a mistake. Ultimately, they didn't really make him into the villain. And he didn't even really fulfill that role in the first movie. I viewed uh, General Hux as more of a villain than Kylo Ren. And I love Donald Gleason, so I liked his performance as Hux. I liked the idea of Hux being... And there's another character who got totally shit on in the next movie. They turned him into a joke, and then they had to kill him in the third one. Yeah. I viewed Hux as interesting because, to me, he was like... Grand Moff Tarkin, but without the reserve, without the cold, calculated gamesmanship of Tarkin. He was a hard-believing, genocidal madman version of Tarkin. Like, someone with the drive of Tarkin if he had been raised on nothing but propaganda. Like, the Empire that we had... And this is, again, these are things that were not explored at all in the subsequent two movies. And ultimately, why they failed for me. Because coming out of The Force Awakens, I had this idea of the way things might go. I had this idea of the First Order, which wasn't really explained very well, and as it turns out, never would be. But I was like, okay, okay, the First Order. They're like... They're a, a reactionary movement of the remnants of the Empire. Like, there are a few older officers left over from the Galactic Empire, but not many. Most of them are these young guys who were raised on stories of the Empire, who are bred from birth like Janissaries to be soldiers, like Finn was supposed to be. Extremists versions of the Empire. Exactly, exactly to square. A Tarkin who believes the shit that he spews. Because when Tarkin does things, like the Tarkin Doctrine, the Death Star, the theory was Tarkin didn't want to kill people. He didn't necessarily care about killing people, but his goal was not to kill people. His goal was to control people. And he wanted to do that through fear of absolute power, and so he had the Death Star created. And you see a similar thing in Hux with the invention of the uh, Starkiller base, but Hux 
didn't just want to control people with it, Hux wanted to wipe out everyone who might oppose him with it. He genuinely wanted them to be dead. And so he created a much, much larger weapon, and he was more dangerous with it because he didn't have the ideology underlying his violence. He just had violence. I thought that was an interesting idea. Apparently, I was reading into it, and it never existed because that's not what they ultimately did. And that felt bad, I, I admit. Borderline 40260. Thank you so much for the follow, my friend. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. Welcome to me complaining about The Last Jedi, as I often do. It's a tired subject, I know. But, you know, sometimes you just gotta complain about The Last Jedi. I still had hope at the end of The Force Awakens. It wasn't a perfect movie, but it had potential. And then they took all that potential and they wasted it. And that did make me sad. J.J. Abrams is not incompetent. I think that J.J. Abrams is a better filmmaker than, say, Zack Snyder. I think there are interesting comparisons to be made between the two of them, because they each similarly kind of have no idea where they're going once they start writing. But J.J. is one of those where it's like, when he has the right people around him, he can make good things. He can also find ways to ruin the good work of the people around him, though, a la Lost. So, I'm not going to sit here and defend J.J. Abrams. I'm just saying I don't think he's necessarily completely incompetent. Now, of course, bear in mind, I say, I sit here in my little office where I work on Plastic Fantasy Man, and I go, J.J. Abrams is incompetent, as he cashes checks that are worth more than my entire life ever will be. Uh, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Oh, Borderline, I am currently building some man-at-arms figures for a game called Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings. Uh, I don't have the finished dudes over here. I have one mostly painted man-at-arms. They're going to be figures like this guy, who still needs some more paint slapped down on him to finish it off. But yeah, we're, we're building a good number of them, and then some cavalry and some mercenary crossbowmen to go on these bases, and then they will all be painted in one big batch. You don't have to be good to be rich, that is very true. But he has to have done something right, Dracari, and I don't know, what they, it might just be who you know. It's possible, but I can't say. I liked Cloverfield. Uh, that's something. Oh, thank you, Borderline. That's very kind of you to say. I don't know how much of a history you have with fantasy or tabletop wargaming in general, but if you like these miniatures, uh, you can go check out my Instagram. I post a lot of pictures over there, man. We're working on something new kind of every day of the week. Sometimes we're building, most of the time we're painting. Nope, don't drop that. Was it a bit of a panic mode about the molten look you were doing on the Tempered Sorcerer but started to like it now that uh, after some additional work? Severe? I don't know how long you've been painting minis. So I don't want to talk down to you. I don't want to be like, oh, you'll find when you paint as many minis as I do, young buck, because that's silly. Um, but I have found over the course of, of painting miniatures that every model has... Saint 15, by the way, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chase. When am I going to put my stuff on Twitter again? Um, White Wolf... I should start doing Twitter again. Uh, I stopped it because Hootsuite wanted to charge me money to post to three social media platforms at once because I was using an aggregator. And now I'm using Facebook's business suite to do that to Instagram and Facebook. I need one that goes to Twitter as well. I guess I could use Hootsuite. Yeah, look at Michael Bay. Yeah. Michael Bay went from the guy who's like, hey, can we bring the brewskis and mystery men to Transformers the fart of the butt, or whatever the latest one is called. I do not know. But Severe, yes, we have I refer to it as, of course Oh, wait. Why Why does this keep happening? My stream deck keeps resetting itself, and this is something I need to fix really quick here. But, uh... Huh. In the meantime, at least I got this back. Every model, though, as you're painting it, you will reach a point where you cross... Over the threshold. That is the point at which what because what you see in your head and what you're doing in paint 
have to catch up to one another. And at first, all models tend to look pretty goofy and, and flat and wrong, but you have to keep pushing, you have to trust yourself, you have to trust your methods, and even if it isn't always going to work out, you just, you have to keep going through that, and eventually you hit the threshold. And that's the point at which the model isn't done, but suddenly you can see the finished figure. You can see the disparate methods coming together. You can see what the model can be. It's always important to push through to that threshold, and it sounds, Sphere, like you have done that. Like I said, you gotta trust yourself. You can't give up on those minis just because it didn't work immediately. A lot of the best painting techniques in the world look kind of stupid before you get to the final few steps. Also, Severe, please feel free to post in the Storm Report, and we'll take a look at it at the end of the stream. I would love, love, love to see your progress on those flamey boys. Severe has been working on the Dwegham army for Conquest the Last Ar Argument of Kings, which is their dwarven faction. And doing some really amazing work, by the way, with the non-metallic metals on that hero figure. Like, really good stuff. Stream Deck is haunted. Yeah, it seems like it might be. I think maybe it, it it screwed up my default screen. Hang on, that should be easy to fix. Let me just take a look real quick. that fixed it, because otherwise I'm going to have to check my profile every time I go to push a button. Um, I might just have to work that out after the stream concludes. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was true or not, Sphere. I didn't want to I didn't want to speak to your experience without knowing more about it, but yeah, a lot of us are in the same boat. It's like, I've been painting for like 20 years, but you wouldn't know it, because I can say I've been painting for 20 years. What I mean is I started painting 20 years ago. And what matters more is what is your longest string of painting and really trying to get good at it. And like you said, for you, it's about, was that six months? Yeah. But man, you're, you do some pretty fucking fine work over there for, for really trying and concentrating for the last six months, man. Hey, Deckard VS. Deckard versus the world. How you doing, man? Thank you so much for that resub. Holy shit, guys. Could we get a shout out, by the way, for Deckard vs. An excellent, excellent art and, 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 and variety. I would say variety does a, does a lot of game streaming, but every now and then you can catch Deckard doing some of his digital art, and oh man, is that ever worth it. Fantastic stream, fantastic community, fantastic streamer. Go give that man a follow if you haven't already. Check out his next stream. I love the digital art streams. I still suck after a year. Eh, you know. That will happen. What is the Ender 3 making? Carry and Litch, you can always hit exclamation point STL in chat to get a readout of what it is that the Ender 3 is working on on that camera. Today it is working on some Battletech terrain from the newly updated files that I have just finished sending off to Steel Warrior Studios for production. Um, we have been picked up officially by Fortress Games and Miniatures, by the way. Hextech Battletech terrain, 6mm sci-fi stuff is going to be carried by Fortress. And here in the near future, it looks like, I won't say for sure on this one, because we haven't hammered out the precise details, but it looks like it will also be available through Ares Games and Miniatures. And I'm pretty excited about that. Got that wife aggro. Oh shit, tank up! Uh, 
I think recent years have revealed more than ever that success in Hollywood isn't really based on talent. You know, so much of success just in life, Spaz Tech, and you might disagree with this. This is just my observations of being alive, you know, my, my limited time here on the earth among people and trying my own endeavors and trying to succeed at things. Um, a huge amount of success is luck. Now, I know that people want to say motivational things about, you know, preparation, meeting opportunity, and blah, 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 but a lot of it's just luck. It's just being in the right place at the right time, talking to the right people, having the right motivation at precisely the right moment. And Hollywood's no different. I think it's, it's a mistake to judge too many films based on single people, too, because every film that is made is, is such a collaborative effort of so many different artistic visions. Sometimes that's not true. Sometimes one person has absolute creative control. Like, that does happen a lot with J.J. Abrams, with George Lucas, um, with James Cameron. And you can go, okay, this guy fucked it up. But I, I think a good exercise is to watch, like... Have you guys have you seen Kingdom of Heaven? The Ridley Scott movie, Kingdom of Heaven? Because there's the theatrical cut of that movie, and it's it's not, it's not good. It feels weird. It, it, it's oddly paced. Uh, the characters are poorly developed. It, it, it jumps past events that it should have dwelt on. It has a very odd message to it overall. And it's just not a very good movie. And then... There's Kingdom of Heaven Director's Cut by Ridley Scott. And it's a completely different film. It is a completely different film. You realize that they wrote out entire characters from the theatrical cut. And the only reason that I mention this, I, I would also say that another good example of this is uh, Blade Runner. Watch uh, Blade Runner... Wait, what cut is it? I can't remember the names of all the Blade Runner cuts, but it's one of the best films to watch to understand how much of a difference editing makes to a film. How much the editor kind of makes the movie. Because there are versions of Blade Runner that are terrible. That are unwatchable. There's the one where it's like they thought audiences were too stupid to know what's going on. And so Harrison Ford reads narration throughout the film where he like explains what his character is doing scene by scene. And it sounds like someone's holding a gun to Harrison Ford's head. Like it's, it's, it is unfucking watchable. And then there's Blade Runner The Final Cut. And uh, there's Director's Cut and Final Cut. I think these are two these are two different ones cuz there's like four cuts of Blade Runner. And I think the Director's Cut is probably the best one cuz it doesn't have the voiceover and it doesn't have the added special effects. And then Final Cut is also excellent, but but in the Final Cut Ridley Scott decided that uh, Rick Deckard is a replicant. He just decided this is true. So he inserted a bunch of visual cues and extra little shots to really push that theme and then sort of make you accept that he is a robot. And I don't really see what that adds to the movie because the question of if he's a replicant or not is brought up in the director's cut loosely, very vaguely. It's left to your imagination. And I think that that was good. And then him answering it, him just coming out and going, oh yeah, no, he totally is. I feel like that, that deflates the movie. Because the question of whether he is or not, what constitutes real life and artificial life, is the fascinating part of Blade Runner for me. So to, to come out and go, yes, one way or the other, takes away the mystique. It's one of the reasons that I dislike Blade Runner 2049. I disliked it for several reasons. But that was one of them, where it's just like, yep, he, he, was, he was a robot, and he had a robot baby with the other robot, and robot, robot, robot. I'm like, eh. I didn't want answers to any of these questions, and that's all you seem to have to give me. Don't get me wrong, it's a beautifully made film. I just, I don't like what it did with the story. But my point, ultimately, is that films are a collaborative effort. And there can be perfectly good movies edited poorly that wind up being big, confusing pieces of shit. And I think that it's important to take this into account when we discuss and judge film. Because if you watch one version of Kingdom of Heaven, you'll come out of the movie going, Wow, that movie fucking sucked. And then you watch the director's cut, and it's, it's different. It's totally different. It has entire plots that were removed. Whole character motivations that just don't exist in the theatrical cut. 
That would be. I, I thought that might have been the theatrical cut because that was the one that was really, really dumbed down. And I don't blame Ford for hating it because it was like it shat all over his performance. And he had to do it himself. Like he had to read the terrible voiceovers. And he did not sound like he was into it at all. You know what's funny, Spaz Tech, is... Oh, hey, Chewie, how you doing? Good to see you, man. Um, Spaz Tech, I, I, I don't like... I don't like Prometheus. I don't like Alien Covenant, or whatever it's called. But when I look at those movies, I find myself thinking, and really ask yourself this, if you took those movies... And okay, some of the dumber physical things should be removed, but you could save those movies in editing if the first step that you took was to say, okay, these movies have nothing to do with Alien. Step one, remove all references to Alien, change the necessary name so that it has nothing to do with Alien, it's just a completely unrelated sci-fi plot. Definitely change some of the character behavior, particularly in Prometheus, because that was one of the weakest aspects of it. But the concepts behind it are workable. The concepts behind it could actually yield an interesting movie about the concept of uh, the the created seeking its creator. It could have been a good movie. Same thing with Alien Covenant. But it's it's its association with the Alien franchise that weakens it to the point where I don't want to watch it anymore. I think that what made me think of this was watching um, Raised by Wolves. Have, have you seen this? Uh, it was the show on... What was Raised by Wolves on? Was it on Showtime? Cinema Stop said it, said it best. Prometheus was, dude, don't touch that, the movie. Yeah. Characters behaving in completely unbelievable ways. But I mean, all that could be fixed. The concepts are perfectly sound. Just don't make it about aliens and get a better script doctor on some of the, the less conceptual parts. Fastbender is a, is a delight. They wasted everybody in those movies. They wasted Numi Rapace, who I don't even like her all that much. I agree. Yeah, Datron, I'm completely with you on that. Or, like, the character whose whole thing is that he has these little... Oh, I dropped it, but I saw where it went. The character whose whole thing, his whole character introduction, is that he has these little drones that can map everything, and then, like, 20 minutes later, he's the only character that can't find his way out of the place. Like, what? Why? Why? What? What? <laughs> what? Huh? It's a very frustrating film for me. But, Raised by Wolves... Raised by Wolves is kind of exactly that. It's all those ideas that Ridley Scott really wants to explore. Uh, high levels of transhumanism, um, the existence of artificial intelligence and how it relates to the existence of true intelligence, and the concept of God. Not just God, but the concept of creation and of being a creation and what impact that has on the psyche and the tendency of the created to seek the approval and guidance of that which created them. I think Raised by Wolves explores it much better because Raised by Wolves is its own setting that isn't related to Alien in any way and thus it's not tied down by those concepts. I think that in, in, in Raised by Wolves, you actually have some interesting instances of machines, and it's, it's some of my favorite things in the show. There's two robots called Mother and Father, and they are sent to this planet with a bunch of human embryos in order to save the human race, basically, because a huge war is destroying the Earth. And... These machines, untethered from the guidance of anyone else and in charge of raising these human beings, and there's, there's a lot more that happens, obviously, on top of that, but they have a very, very compelling segment where these machines are essentially developing their own religion, but it's a very 
logical religion. It is, it's, it's, it's sort of an exploration for how religion can be born from logical exploration and from limited information. It's, it's fascinating watching robots essentially become religious. But not in like a hackneyed way. It's not like they find Christianity. It's like they they develop their own concepts that when you look at them objectively are like, well, this is a faith, is what this is. Crusader guys and Raised by Wolves make me picture them as how the Necromongers might have started. Yeah, I liked them. What were they called? The uh, They were sun worshippers. They weren't even necessarily Christians. Like their, their religious icon was a sun and they worshipped Saul, the sun. They had a name, and I can't remember what it was, but it related to some old Zoroastrian shit. Space Crusaders. And, of course, it has Travis Fimmel in it, which I'll, I'll watch anything with Travis Fimmel in it. I just love the way that dude performs. I, I won't even say he's, like, the greatest performer ever. He just has this, this bizarre screen charisma that really gets me. You know, WJ, I was just thinking the other day, I should rewatch Exo Squad. Because I haven't watched Exo Squad since I was a little kid, and my memory of its story is really flimsy. I remember it being good and compelling and interesting, I just don't remember the specifics of it. it wasn't the Atten, was it? No, it wasn't Eternal, it was something else. It was, I want to say, it was an ancient word for sun, but I can't remember what it's called. It's been a while. And okay, the season finale of season one of Raised by Wolves is like some just off-the-wall Ridley Scott, high-concept, symbolic fucking madness. But I loved it for what it was and being self-contained because it wasn't also trying to tie into aliens. No, it wasn't. No, uh, no. I'm sure somebody could just look it up. I, I feel stupid for not for not remembering what it's called. Can we watch Zat slash Bloodwaters of Doctor Z? No, <laughs> no, WJ. We cannot watch Zat. I have seen Zat. It is so like for for every point of true entertainment in Zat, there is ten minutes of nothing happening. It's painful. Strike 2 is a more developed version of what Asimov did with one of the first robot stories. Yeah, I can see that, Datron Voltari. Like with the evolution of our Daniel Oliva through the Caves of Steel and the Robots of Dawn. It's a very similar Mithraic. Thank you so, so much, Roland. They were called the Mithraic. That's right. After Mithra. There's a lot of weird shit going on in that show, too, because there's also something about, like, the Mithraic discovered dark... Not dark matter, but dark energy, a new form of energy that they discovered by reading their ancient Mithraic texts. And... It's basically magic. Like, they developed a technology that is essentially magic from reading their ancient texts, and they use that to build a machine that they wield as a weapon, but they don't fully understand. I really like Raised by Wolves. It still has a chance to get, like, extra double-secret stupid and not go anywhere, but I'm with it for where it is. Oh, 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 I know the one you talk you're talking about the one in iRobot Datron Voltari. That's the one where the robot where the the um the they call them necromancers to square, but they don't really operate like necromancers do. But there's the robot, he's on a mining station, and this, this is one of my favorite stories. There's a robot on a mining station, and there are humans who are stationed there, I think one human. And the human, like the robot doesn't need to know anything outside of the functioning of the space station, so he understands 
Periodically, this door opens, and from that door come supplies. Those supplies we use here to do these things. We take the product of what we do, we put it in that door at a certain time, and it goes someplace, I don't care where, and this is my life. That's what it understands. And there is a time when the human is trying to explain to him, like, no, there's a planet out there called Earth, and it's where I'm from. And these are ships that are coming to us through the vastness of space, and they're bringing supplies, and the robot is so condescending. He's like, that's ridiculous. Why would you ever think that? That's nonsense. These, this insane fantasy of some magical world out there that you're from, and they send supplies in rocket ships through the vastness of space, something you can't prove exists, by the way. And it's all the way down to the point where he, like, opens the window, and he's like, look, look at that space. Out that window is space. And he's like, I don't know what that is. For all I know, that could be a black sheet with holes punched in it and a light behind it. Like, how do you prove any of this to a being of pure logic who was not programmed with an intrinsic understanding of it? To someone who didn't have to learn any of these things? To someone whose existence is entirely focused on... It's just, it's a wonderful mathematical story about the sort of myopic view of one's own life. And how something can be objectively true, but through the scope of your experience could seem insane. I, I love iRobot. I am a huge Asimov fan. Which makes me very, very curious for the Foundation series that they're developing at... It's not Amazon, it's not HBO, is it Showtime who's doing the, the Foundation series? With... Uh... Roland, be my secondary brain. Ah, uh, shit. Who's the actor? I can see his face. I can hear his voice. He was in The Terror. He was in The Expanse. He is the son of a famous actor, and he is fantastic, and his name is... It's not Apple. God damn it, Roland. No, it's not Lee Pace. He plays Anderson Dawes in The Expanse. Oh, Apple's doing... Okay, that makes way more sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Liz Anderson Dawes in the expense. Somebody help me out because I'm having a brain fart. Apple TV. I still have not gotten a subscription to that to watch any of what they've made, which Rob McElhenney did a show for Apple TV that I keep meaning to watch. Oh, it's right on the tip of my damn brain. Jared Harris, thank you so, so... I got Harris at the end there. I was like, it's Harris. It's Jared Harris, yeah. Thank you so much, Dracari and Data Nerd. Jared Harris is attached to the Foundation show project. And that's exciting for me. Jared Harris is a great actor. Like, really good. Have you guys watched The Terror, by the way? That show was fantastic. You got Jared Harris and um, <clears throat> Kieran Hines in that show. I feel like they did a second season that I still haven't watched about some other event. Lee Pace is in it? Okay. Well, that explains that. I like those early robot stories, though. I like iRobot. Um, I like the Caves of Steel. I like the Robots of Dawn. I enjoy the Foundation series quite a lot, too. And I'm very curious where they're going to go with that, because the Foundation sci-fi series is a... It's a pretty ambitious one. It's, it's, it's big. Its scope is very grand. It was one of the first stories I read as a kid where it was a sci-fi story set in the future of modern mankind, and Earth was a myth. Like... The history books all talked about Earth. You know, people knew about Earth, but it was like an urban legend. It was like, you know, nobody's been there in thousands of years. Nobody even knows where it is anymore. People argue about whether it was wiped out in nuclear holocaust or conquered by someone or just never existed in the first place. I always thought that was a cool idea. For All Mankind, the Alternate Universe Space Race show is quite... I don't think I've seen anything about that. You know what was a cool fucking movie that came out a little while ago? Was... I'm gonna think of the name of it. I'm gonna think of the name of it. I could describe the entire plot to you in detail, and I'm forgetting the name. 
It was called The Dark of Night. Is it called The Dark of Night? It was about a radio station host and a young girl in either high school or junior high school who also operated uh, the phone switchboard in her small, tiny little town. And they were both very interested in science, whereas the rest of the town was your, your classic small town, more interested in the outcome of the local sports game, you know, high school against high school. And I think it's called Dark of Night. It's something of night. But <clears throat> it sort of follows them as mysterious events happen around the town. There's like a radio broadcast that somebody thinks might be from a UFO. There are sightings. There's weird stuff. And it's them kind of following this story and getting details on it after he gets these weird readings at his, at his radio station. And it's so good. It's so good. It came out fairly recently, and I should really remember the name of it. As the USSR reached the moon first and triggers a further race to settle the moon, go to Mars, etc. It kind of reminds me of Asimov's story, The Man Who Sold the Moon. It had a similar kind of idea to it, but then he was always sort of looking a little bit further into the future, wasn't he? I like how Asimov proposed in The Man Who Sold the Moon. Wait, was that Asimov or was that Heinlein? Oh, shit. I want to say it was Asimov, but that might have been Heinlein. Somebody tell me, was the man who sold the moon Heinlein or Asimov? I feel like an idiot for not remembering which. How does this game's rules look? Carrie and Lich, if you are at all familiar with Warhammer Fantasy Battles, the classic Warhammer Fantasy Battles, it draws a lot of inspiration from the last edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. It has a couple of more updated concepts uh, in like the initiative system where that was Heinlein. Yeah, you're right. I was thinking about that like, no, that, that, that was much too sardonic and cynical to be Asimov. Asimov was more analytical. Asimov was... Asimov, the vast of night. Thank you, Roland. That's the one I'm thinking of. But yeah, Asimov was more... Asimov was a mathematician. And he writes like a mathematician. He forms his stories like equations. And he guides you through them a step at a time. And, and like a mathematical equation, when you get to the conclusion of an Asimov story, a mystery, the answer is always looking you right in the face. It's the only thing that it ever could have been. But it's like, because you don't have all the variables, it, it isn't obvious in the beginning. Heinlein is much more cynical and sardonic, and arguably more practical than Asimov. And yeah, his conclusion in The Man Who Sold the Moon was that nobody can ever develop a military presence on the moon because it will ultimately destroy all of mankind, no matter who it is and no matter what their intentions are. Yeah, The Vast of Night. I have to recommend this movie. Uh, if anybody in chat right now, if you enjoy... Sci-fi. Uh, let me tell you what The Vast of Night does. That really stood out to me. Hey, 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 Walter's Workshop. How you doing? Can we get a shout-out, by the way, for Walter's Workshop? One of my favorite streamers on Twitch. Great fucking dude. Also paints Conquest, so you know he's got good taste. Welcome in, my friend. What struck me as I was watching The Vast of Night is that... Kid, and this is going to sound like old folk bullshit, but kids these days, if I can start a sentence with that, kids these days don't understand what it was like to be fascinated by UFOs before the internet. They don't understand what it was like before information was as accessible as it is now. Being into UFO sightings and the concept of aliens was very, very different through the 70s, 80s, 90s. Did I, did I say he was my favorite zombie brush? I'm pretty sure I said one of my favorite, but I could be mistaken. I certainly meant to say one of my favorite. Picking a favorite, that's like picking a favorite movie. I can't really do it. Like, I try sometimes, but I'm usually wrong. It captured for me, though, 
the feeling that I had as a child in the late 80s and, and or through the 90s um, of being fascinated by alien sightings and, and just, just feeling isolated, feeling like you don't have access to all the information, feeling like there's this world of possibility out there that you barely comprehend. And these days you lose a lot of that because when you look up an alien sighting or someone reports something, there's oftentimes a lot of information you can get immediately that's like, oh, that wasn't that, that was this. Um, and, you know, the, the attitudes of the general population towards alien sightings are much more cynical these days. You always have the guy who pops into the conversation. Yeah, culminating in the X-Files. Very much Shock 21. Very much. I think the Vast of Night can put you in the right mindset to understand what people were thinking when the X-Files came to be. But it's, just, it's, it's an amazing film experience. Like, even if you don't give a shit about aliens, go watch The Vast of Night. The way that it's directed, the long cut shots, these unbroken shots that follow them through the town as they go from location to location, the sense uh, of the size of the town that they're in and the mystery as it unfolds, it, it's, it's amazing. It is, a, it is an experience movie. And I'm making myself want to watch it again just talking about it. But yeah, go look it up and watch it. It's really good. The expectation that people have a camera with them that is also... Yes, very much that, nanotanks. Like, back in the day, you could just be in the middle of a field and see a UFO, and it's like, nobody's gonna believe me. You know, it's, it's your experience. It's very personal, it's very isolating. Nobody's, nobody's pulling out their smartphone to get a picture of the UFO. You know, not when you have uh, just a radio. But it's it's not schlocky. It's not kitschy. It's very genuine. It's very real. And it draws you into the setting. Difference is now you post it on the internet and a lot more people don't believe you. <laughs> People can disbelieve you faster and, and with much greater efficiency. Truly, this is the future. from a Japanese zoo a lady photographing a giraffe and it has a blur next to the giraffe's head. <gasps> I don't know that I've seen that one. And maybe it's just a personal thing for me. I just remember as a kid I found the whole phenomenon much more magical and much more inspiring. You know, the UFO sightings and the vast of night for me captured that feeling beautifully. In a way that, like, I don't think I could explain the feeling with words as well as The Vast of Night can explain it with, uh, film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very much Roland. It does. It feels like early Spielberg. Like, uh, the... It feels like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but much more contained and focused. And all oh, some of the performances in it. There's there's a whole long single shot that is nothing but them with the with a, they don't have a camera. They've got a radio or a tape recorder, and they find this woman who had an experience. She says with with a UFO, and the whole shot is nothing but them listening with rapt attention and recording this woman's story. And it just it pulls you into the scene so slowly and so subtly until you're like kind of leaning off the couch and leaning into the TV like that's going to help you hear any better. It's, ooh, it's good. I want to believe. I really do, Manix. I really do. How you doing today, man? God, this is, this is boring, drudgerous work that is going to yield a good final product. Thank you guys for joining me today for it, for keeping me keeping my mind moving while I do this. <laughs> this, by the way, these little ridges on top of the shoulder pad, this is probably the worst thing about this set of models. I feel it is, is necessary to remove it. 
Because, like, on this one, for instance, you, you're tempted to be like, oh, it's supposed to be part of the shoulder pad, but it's not even centered on this one. It's just part of the mold. But again, this the Man-at-Arms, I believe, are the first models that they made. And they have shown huge improvements in every single model set subsequently. I feel sure at some point they'll probably revisit and release new plastic Man-at-Arms, but I wouldn't anticipate that happening for a while. You know what's funny is, growing up, Manix, I was more of a Scully. And now, as an adult, I'm much more of a Mulder. You would think that that would go the other way. Ooh, got some new IPA for the bases. That's out. Zombie Brush Studios and Walter's Workshop are two of my, uh... My test cases, they are the fine gents who have received the files for these um, Fields of the Fallen magnetic bases complete with regiment connector sockets. Oh, I didn't put magnets in the bottom of this one. Oh, whoopsies, I'll have to do that. Um, but they are going to be printing out and testing some of these, and I really, really appreciate it. I value you guys' feedback. Um, I, I want to get at least one round of feedback before I release these for sale, just to be sure that everything is on the up and up. I'm not that cool to square. Bark Axe Miniatures, thank you so much for the follow. Bark Axe, are you a streamer? Your 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 name sounds like you're a streamer. Yes, data nerd, that would be fantastic. I'll send the files your way. I just want to make sure that I haven't missed something huge, so I don't release the files and people go, oh, this guy sucks. Because I haven't released that many resin files. I will say that I think these are the best resin files I've released yet. Um, notably, the files are not like 200 gigabytes, not 200 gigabytes, 200 megabytes each, like my first set of bases. Nobody's complained about those, but after I release them, I'm like embarrassed about them. Like, I could have optimized those so much better. These ones are much more optimized. You are indeed. Well, thank you so much, Barkax. I'm hoping to get them actually painted so we can show them off. A wee little bit better. Let's pop on over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 75mm Werewolf Queen. Working on some Skaven for Blood Bowl. Oh, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and drop a follow there. Magnets. How do they work? You remember when we thought those were the dumbest guys on the planet? Oh. Uh, those innocent salad days. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with these with these bases overall, and I'd like to continue this set. Like, this is sort of my proof of concept. If it's successful, if people like it, if people actually buy this set, well, I'll I'll expand it and do some more. But you can see, like, I've got a Greek style shield over here, kind of bent up and in the dirt. We have sort of a Norse style round shield over here. We've got more of a Western European blade and a halberd head here. I've really tried to do a pretty good mix of different cultures that are cultures that were inspirational for the Conquest miniature line, but without just duplicating the weapons. Because I could have done that. I could have just duplicated all the weapons that the guys in Conquest have and put them on the bases, but I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's kind of lame, isn't it? We'll just use their inspiration. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, people tell me that. I got, I got the voice and the face, as it were. I beat you to it, Roland. You can't make fun of me if I make fun of myself, son of a bitch. Bazinga! Oh no, what have I done? Don't, no, let's not, let's not make that a thing. I fucking hate that show. I just spent a while ago, like 20 minutes talking about how nothing is really bad and you shouldn't feel bad for liking bad things. And I'm going to throw all that out the window by saying that the Big Bang Theory is fucking... It's, it's, it's awful. It's a goddamn crime against humanity. I hate that fucking show. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you like it and you're thinking, Oh no, Thunderhead doesn't like the thing that I like. But I promise you, I promise you right now, that's not the only thing. See what I mean? 
Well, Project Dark Fox over here is like, oh, no, we can't be friends anymore. I promise you, Project Dark Fox. I probably hate other things that you like, too. I, I don't I don't like IPAs. I will drink... This is the thing. I don't hate IPAs. Pale ales. I don't hate them. I'll drink them. But I'm one of those assholes that always wants a slice of citrus with them, and I'm usually only drinking them because somebody's been like, this IPA is the best thing ever and you have to try it. I'm never going to pick one out for myself. I mean, Project Dark Fox also considered the things that I like unironically. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. Because I'll be like, oh, the Big Bang Theory is the worst thing ever. Have you watched the 75 episode run of an anime from 1981 that was only recently translated into English? Like, eh. <laughs> Does my opinion mean anything? I don't know. Compliment the Star Wars Christmas movie. It needs to be real convincing and you have to finish it with Bazinga. Okay, so Force Compliment, you can make me say good things about the Star Wars Christmas special. You cannot make me sign off with, with, with that. You can't make me do that. Oh, you didn't realize it was said sarcastically. Yeah, no, that was entirely sarcasm. No, if I ever unironically praise the Big Bang Theory, you can fucking, you just, you should quit. Something's wrong with me. Call a hospital. Oh, <laughs> zombie brush. You didn't get me to, you know what? I'm not gonna have this argument. I'm not gonna have this argument. So you want something good about the Star Wars Christmas special. Okay, hang on. I got it. I got it. I got something I like about the Star Wars Christmas special. So, I'm gonna say that it has one moment of decent background world building for the Galactic Empire. In the show, the Empire comes to inspect the Baca, I assume Baca is their last name, the Baca home on Kashyyyk for rebels. They're like, oh, you got any rebels? You got any rebels hiding here? You seen any rebels? And when they don't find any, they leave behind one single stormtrooper to guard them, to just threaten them periodically, I think, is what he's there for. He just kind of points his gun at people a whole lot. And he's like, I'm a bad guy. And towards the end, Han Solo shows up. And I don't even know if he kills him on purpose. It's like he accidentally shoves him through a railing that one of the other Wookiees were balancing on earlier in the show. Which calls into question the safety of all of their homes, by the way. Bark Axe, I'm with you. I love a good sour. I really do. I only discovered sours recently, but I fell in love. Um... So they leave behind this one stormtrooper, and Han Solo shoves him through a railing, and he falls to his death. Okay, so then they call... Oh, yeah, okay, they also did introduce us to Boba Fett. That's a good one, Ion Raptor, but this, this is one that I'm going with. They call the local Imperial Magistrate, or his commander, whoever, and they're like, Ah, oh, the stormtrooper you left, he stole a bunch of our food, and he just kind of took off. And what always struck me as funny about that is that the Stormtrooper commander that they have on the view screen, who they're like, oh, your man took our food and abandoned, uh, abandoned you, he just left. He doesn't act like this is unexpected. He has this response to the effect of, no, oh, that'll happen. <laughs> He's just kind of like, okay, fine, this is like the third time this has happened this week. I thought that was funny. Because in my head, that's building up, like, the Empire, for all of its bullshit, they're like, oh, another deserter, that's the third one, okay. We gotta stop leaving these stormtroopers alone. Because <laughs> they'll just take people's food and leave. It does manage the lemur, but I propose that that is a, a decent, albeit unintentional, piece of Star Wars world building hidden within the Star Wars Christmas special. I say unintentional because I don't believe for a second that that's what they, like, I don't think anybody thought about that when they did it. They were just kind of doing things. And then they were like, uh, what are we going to do for the next one? I don't know, B. Arthur is going to sing a song about how great it is to get drunk in Moss Eisley. Alright, whatever. 
Oh, thank you, Barkax. Infinity models are nice, man. We got a number of people uh, on the Discord and in the community who paint Infinity as well. White Wolf, you paint Infinity, don't you? Steela Rebel isn't around, but she's painted some Infinity. Nano tanks. Nano tanks. I don't want to be the kind of streamer who just says no to a channel points request. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy, but you're putting me in that position, and I feel like you knew you were doing it when you redeemed that, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to think about it for a minute, because the compliment is very broad. I don't have to compliment the writing of the show. I don't have to compliment the acting. I don't have to compliment... Ugh, fuck. Um... Um, okay, okay, okay. Best I can do. Best I can do. Complimenting the Big Bang Theory. Thanks to the Big Bang Theory, I once wore a... Reverse Flash t-shirt to my in-law's house. These, these kindly older folk. And they recognized it as being from The Flash. That's the best I got. That is the best I got. It, it, was, it was nice for a moment to have someone be like, oh, it's, it's like The Flash. When I wasn't expecting it. I later discovered it was because of the Big Bang Theory. Because they watched that show. That's the best you're gonna fucking get. So, I hope you're happy with that. They didn't know it was Reverse Flash. They thought it was a... They were like, why is that Flash symbol in all the opposite colors? And then I had to explain who the reverse Flash is to an older couple who genuinely did not care. I guess I didn't have to, but I did. And ultimately that's the price they pay for watching The Big Bang Theory, is having a 30-year-old man explain the reverse Flash. God, that hurt. It's like when you hold in a sneeze, that oh, it just hurts. Infinity fun game, very fiddly. I've heard that. I've heard that code zero, code red, um, code Veronica, whatever it's called, the new slightly stripped down version intro sets are, are good for getting people into it. I keep thinking about maybe picking that up and trying out Infinity, but I've, I've never actually played the game. I've seen it played enough to be like, I don't know if I want to do that. Like, I like everything about Infinity, I just don't know if it's for me to actually play. Code 1, thank you. IPAs, drinking kind, what? not the resin Finger tips kind. covered in super glue are not approved safety gear for handling razor blades. A light IPA with a fresh slice of orange can be very refreshing on a hot day. And that is about the only context in which I will enjoy an IPA. Other than that, I think they're like, uh... This is way too goddamn hoppy for me. It depends on the IPA, Roland. 
But a nice slice of citrus usually goes a long way. I don't hate IPAs. Like, if someone... I'll usually drink them in the context of I'm going to a restaurant or a bar with someone, you know, before that, when, when people still did that. And, um... They'll be like, oh, you've got to try this amazing IPA. I love it. It's the best thing ever. And I'll be like, I'll have I'll have one. I'll have a pint. And I'll be like, oh, that's good. It's great. And I'm, I'm waiting until I can order literally anything else. It's not like how I feel about gin, where someone orders me a drink with gin in it, and I'm like, take that shit the fuck back. Get me almost anything else that will fuck me up that doesn't have your terrible berry booze in it. prefer a double IPA to the regular IPA. You know, that's the thing, though. Like, I, I don't, I'll never hold the taste of alcohol against anyone because alcohol is by itself... I think all alcohol is essentially an acquired taste. There are very few alcoholic beverages that are just tasty. That are just like, you're going to drink it and go, this is amazing. Uh, it's like coffee. There, there's no... There, there's very, very few instances of people who drink coffee the first time and go, this is delicious and I want to keep drinking it. You drink it for another reason, and as you drink it and you acquire the taste and you have it enough times, you discover the complexity and the flavor and you teach yourself to enjoy it. And that's not a false enjoyment, that's a very real enjoyment, but it is learned. I think all beer is that way. You know, you can you feel free to prove me wrong if you were one of those rare people who had a beer and was like, this is delicious and I want to keep drinking it like you just had your first Coke or something. But I don't think that really happens. I keep trying to want to like coffee and it fails every time. I developed a taste for black coffee. I mean, not just black coffee, obviously. I, I like my coffee black so that I can actually experience most of the flavor of it, though. But I, I developed a taste for coffee in the most just dorky and embarrassing possible fucking way. Like, I had been drinking coffee for a long time, and I enjoyed it, but I was a cream and sugar man. And then I watched a television show. Zima's and Jolly Ranch. Oh, no. <laughs> I watched a television show. And then I started drinking my coffee black. And then I developed more of an appreciation for the flavor of good coffee. And I want you to guess. I want you to guess, chat. What show did I watch? that caused me to start drinking black coffee. It's right up there with that with the, the friend of yours that suddenly developed an appreciation for Pinot Noir right after watching Sideways. You know that guy? You all know that guy. It's just as bad, but I'll own it. And the prize goes to Chewy. Yeah, WJ, yeah. You, you were slightly slower, but the confidence with which you say it, yeah. I feel like I wasn't the only one, though. That was, if you will pardon my language, a damn fine cup of coffee. Oh, Dale Cooper. I still haven't finished watching Twin Peaks The Return, and I feel almost bad about it. I struggle with David Lynch. Like, I, I do enjoy David Lynch. I like David Lynch once I've had time to process it, but... The act of actually watching David Lynch and then trying going through the processing and the analysis of what I just watched is painful. It's always painful. I, I like the product that it yields mentally. I feel like it really aids my appreciation of filmmaking in general. But it is a painful process that I don't always want to go through. And I have not yet had the motivation to do that with Twin Peaks The Return. I know I should. Particularly since I like Kyle MacLachlan's performances, particularly in David Lynch properties, as much as I do. 
This is terrible, by the time we get to the end of the stream, you know what I will have done? I will have successfully cleaned the mold lines off of about 11 miniatures. Like, <laughs> that's it. Oh, I forgot how long this takes sometimes. But thank you guys for hanging out with me through it. It hasn't been as mind-numbing as it usually is. I've still got more to go. Mafik! Welcome in, man. How you doing? Best coffee, ever, best coffee you ever had was in Guatemala on a coffee farm. And that makes sense. I'll bet it was delicious, too, Data Nerd. Fresh roasted? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Rangonia says to get up early for work. Good night, Rangonius. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. From the beginning, too. You were one of the first ones in chat, man. Rangonius, it's always a pleasure to see you, man. I hope you have a great night. Sleep well. Have a good day at work. And thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. I hope to see you again later this week. We'll be back Tuesday. Nicaragua on a mission trip. No bite or bitterness, just a smooth texture. Yeah, the bite, the acidity almost always comes. The, the, the acidity of a black coffee is, is resultant of, of poor handling and uh, bad brewing most of the time. Off topic, but sounds appropriate for this channel. Thoughts on Love, Death, and Robots. I have not watched the latest season yet. I cannot possibly comment on the latest release of Love, Death, and Robots. I've heard mixed reviews of it. Since it is an anthology, that makes sense. I feel like anthologies are always going to have mixed reviews because of the nature of what they are. I quite liked the first season of Love, Death, and Robots, but here's one for you, Bark Axe. Because I can only discuss the first season, because it's the only one I've seen. What was your favorite? entry in Love, Death, and Robots Season 1. I know what mine is, but I'd like to know what yours is before I, I say it. A number of people in this chat know what my favorite one was. Monsters or cavalry, but still want me to try out those bases. Uh, if you just want to just print them and, and let me know how those work out for you, I mean, yeah, that'd be fine, zombie. You don't, don't, zombie brush, don't feel obligated. Like, you're not, you're not working for me or anything. I'm not going to obligate you to test print. I'm just giving them to you in any that you want to use. Please test them. And, and please let me know what you think. Just consider them a gift. Suits. That makes sense, Roland. I also... Suits, I think... I think I enjoy watching Suits the most out of all the ones in Season 1. Like, it's just the one that I, I enjoy sitting down and watching from start to finish. It's just fun. But it's not my favorite. Data Nerd, thank you for the reminder. SP Firestarter also... Yeah, I, I keep letting my... I gotta get a new chair, you guys. I gotta get a new chair. That might actually become the subject of... We haven't had a donation goal on this stream since last year when y'all motherfuckers went completely nuts and donated something ridiculous like $800 over the course of a few nights and got this camera that we're using now. And I'll just tell you, I fully confess, I have felt reluctant to have another one since then, because the response to that one was absolutely mind-blowing. You guys paid for upgrades to the stream that should have been something that sat for like six months until they happened. But maybe I will try having another one. Obviously, there's no expectation people are actually going to donate. I'm just, I feel like I'm at a point now where maybe I'll feel comfortable asking for, like, if you'd like to help the stream a little bit, maybe we could get a new chair. Because, man, that would, that would be nice. <laughs> I don't like money. There we go, Chaotic. No! Everyone was just so generous that I felt like, okay, this is, this is all the generosity I can let people have for a while. Because that was, that was nuts. That's right. Nope, you're right, White Wolf. We also, we did have the uh, the donation for uh, Riot Sisters Puppo. We raised a little bit of money to help her with some medical expenses, and that was amazing of you guys, too. Alright, there we 
go. There's all those arms. Now I just gotta do all these other arms and then the heads on, then I can build them. Oh god. I returned the cameras for the game room. Data Nerd, I returned them. I haven't gotten the new C920s yet. They're gonna have to be C920s. Um, those cameras that were recommended by Teal Sekiri were, they're probably good just for streaming, but they were not good for anything close up, which is unfortunately what I need them for, because the way I'm setting it up, I'm going to have a bird's eye view, a overall view of the table and myself, and then I'm going to have a moving model eye view, and I need cameras that have much, much better focus for that particular purpose. Everybody seems to like Lucky 13. Beyond a I like that one too, Gus Schultz. The one with the weird alien consciousness and the the, the lost jump coordinate. That was a good one. And Secret War. I was not a huge fan of Secret War. I loved Zima Blue. Zima Blue was my top pick for Love, Death, and Robots Season 1. about the one with the alien spider lady. Eh, not as good. Zima Blue... Zima Blue, for me, just had so much philosophical meat on it, you know? It was, it, it was a lot to chew. Hold on a second. Oh, hey, Wolf and Spawn. Good to see you. Don't know any of the titles on those episodes. Uh, Suits. That was that was that one. Suits. Justicar was the one with the farmers versus the Zerg. Hey, Smack Weasel. How you doing today? Oh, man. Hold on. I see that I got a donation, but it's not showing me any of the associated information. This is the first time we've gotten a donation since I've started using this new OBS. Hmm, where can I see that? Which one of you fine people did this? Hang on. Let me just pull up Streamlabs right quick. I don't want to let that go unmarked. Harmony. Chaotic, thank you so much, man. Five bucks for the chair fund, getting things started off, getting the ball rolling as it is. Yeah, like it showed up on the overlay, but it didn't show up in chat and it didn't show up on my event manager, and I need to look at why that is. Chaotic, I'm so sorry for missing that the first time. Thank you so much for the five bucks, my man. We'll get that put towards a fund for the chair, and uh, who knows, we might actually have a goal up here pretty soon to get that taken care of. Because, yeah, my current chair has... I've complained... I just, you know, if I complain about something enough times, I start to think, like, maybe this is a problem I should actually address, and I have been complaining about my chair lately. Yeah, Zima Blue was very visually striking. The animation style was interesting, and I love the the overall arc of it with this highly complex mechanical life form realizing that for all the experiences that it's had, for all the ways that it's grown, it was ultimately happier when it was just... when it knew its purpose. It was happier when its purpose was simple, when it was directed, when it was easy to determine, when there was nothing outside of that. 
and all of its more advanced life has been complexity and confusion and none of it was necessary. I thought that that was beautiful. Almost as beautiful as the gamer who was a day late, day late gamer 12. Months have no fear, it is me, just sub for a year. Thank you so much for that. Looks like we've got $10 coming in from Zombie Bros Studios for the chair fund. You guys, there isn't even a donation goal yet. But thank you guys so much. I really do appreciate it. I will, I'll make sure that when I start the counter, it starts with that 15 rolled right in there. Wait, did I say 20? Did I say 10? I'll check later. I'm sorry. I've just been bitching about my chair and justifying having a, a, a donation goal. Daylight Gamer. Bark Axe Miniatures with the Tier 1 sub. Bark Axe, thank you so much, man. You know... As a streamer, it's always a pretty awesome experience when someone kind of shows up in chat for the first time and you get a follow and a sub on the same day. And it's not because I'm like, ah ha ha ha, I made, I made $2.50 this month, now I can quit my job. No. It's, um... I just love that, that Bark Axe, you, you, you came in today and you had a good enough time that you feel like subbing, dude. That's fucking awesome. It really means the world. Project Dark Fox with $10 for the sake of my spine. Prawns paid for this donate. Well, as long as it's being paid for by smut, I don't mind. But Bark Axe, thank you so much for that sub. Thank you for the follow, man. And I'm, I'm glad that you've been having fun. Daylight Gamer, how you doing, man? Can we get a shout-out, by the way? Could we pretty, pretty please get a shout-out for the Daylight Gamer? Welcome, everyone, chat enough. to Thunderhead Studios, where the only rule is... Please don't show me your genitals. Please don't. Have fun, be safe, and above all... Don't, don't show them to me. Don't do for it. For the love of God. Don't do it. DLG, my favorite variety streamer here on Twitch. Good personal friend of mine, one of my oldest friends, and the man who really inspired me to start streaming here on Twitch. The man who gave me my most early advice, helped me out with my technical problems starting off, and got me going on this wild and crazy journey. I, I definitely got inspiration from a lot of people, but DLG was the one who got me turned on to Twitch and convinced me this might be a good idea. So DLG, thank you so much for that. And guys, go give him a follow. He has a fantastic variety stream, great community, wonderful people. Ooh. Give me one second, folks. I'm gonna hit you with the BRB screen and I'll be back in just a minute. We're gonna be rolling into the storm report in just a few minutes, so don't touch that. Dial, I will see you in one hot second.
can kind of see that. I can kind of see that DLG. It's got a bit of that, uh... Makes me think of... That is a... That is a very nice hat. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> oh, that fucking movie. How you doing, DLG? It's good to see you. Yeah, we do we do once monthly uh, movie nights. This this month we're watching some bad ones. We'll only watch Robot Jocks every month and never get tired of. It. We haven't actually done Robot Jocks yet, which is I mean it's surprising. I know because it's it's such a high quality film. But we have not actually watched Robot Jocks as part of our monthly movie night yet. We should. I think that we need to make it part of like a Jeffrey Coombs double feature because he's in it for like one whole scene. So we could do like Robot Jacks and From Beyond. Just for, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum. Going over charts for tomorrow and dropping your lurk juice everywhere. Well, the good news is I've got mods that can probably clean that up. But, you know, don't, don't leave too much. Such a thing as too much juice, DLG. Was that a ro yes, that is a serious scene in the film. That scene's not even presented as comedy. There's there's just a scene where one robot has like his legs folded up into tank treads, and the other robot unfolds his crotch, and a chainsaw comes out, and he proceeds to saw into the the other robot. Like it is comedic, but at the same time, you're like, oh, actually, that that crotch saw seems pretty useful in this particular context. Okay. Fair game, four-legged Russo bot. First movie Daylight Studios will put out will be a new and improved robot jocks. Dude, le just let me get like a writer's credit on that. Because I can think of the, the parts of robot jocks that you should focus on and the parts that should probably be cut out of the movie. Like the part where the male character forcibly kisses the unconscious female character who has expressed not only a lack of desire to be with him in any shape, way, shape, or form, but actually a strong disdain for him and everything that he is. Like that scene where he really, Gary Graham, just mashes lips with an unconscious young girl. Yeah, we can probably cut that out of the film. Bark Axe, have a fantastic dinner. I'm glad that you had fun, man, and I uh, hope to see you back. We stream here Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. We usually do a different thing each day of the week and try to keep up progress on our projects. I, I hope to see you again, man. I'm glad you had fun. And if you ever feel like posting some of your own work, we do the Storm Report at the end of every stream. We're going to be starting that here in, like, one minute. It's a, it's a pretty fun bit, and we'd love to see some of your painting in there. Oh my god, oh my god, Wonder Woman 1984 is so, so fucking bad on that front. And also a Gypsy Danger Easter Egg would be perfect, because Gypsy Danger totally does an Easter Egg from Robot Jocks in Pacific Rim. It would be full circle if you then did a Robot Jocks that pays homage to Pacific Rim. It's like poetry, it rhymes. What's up, y'all? How you doing, Trotsky? Yeah, there are so many problems with Wonder Woman 1984. There's so many problems. That's that's the biggest and most glaring one, is the part where Wonder Woman rapes an unsuspecting, unrelated man. I don't know how Patty Jenkins wrote a superhero movie, the core message of which is stop aspiring to be more than you are and be comfortable with, with yourself right now. Like, I'm not even saying this is a bad message, but it is a wholly inappropriate message for a fucking DC superhero film. DC superheroes are all about aspiration, and the message of this movie was stop aspiring. At least I think that's what it was. I don't know, it's hard to tell what the message was, because it seems like each character got a different lesson, some of which were diametrically and philosophically opposed. So I should not let your dad know. Hold up. One second. End of back. Skipped Wonder Woman after you watched the Critical Drinkers review. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it is um. 
We were talking earlier about how some movies aren't bad, they're just misunderstood. Wonder Woman 1984 is a terrible film. Like, I have issues with the first Wonder Woman, but I enjoyed it, and I think that overall it was a good movie with some problems. Wonder Woman 1984 is just trash. It's just insane nonsense and garbage. It's amazing how much money they wasted on it, too. And yeah, legitimately, there's like unforced errors that are they're unbelievable. Like Pete Trevor coming back to life. Pete? Steve? Steve Trevor? Steve Rogers? Whatever. He comes back to life in the body of some strange man who is apparently still alive. And they're just like, let's take this man's life and have sex with his body. Who cares who he was? Like, they didn't have to have him inhabiting anybody's body at all. He could have just been Steve Trevor. For God's sake, later in the movie, the same wishing stone they used to bring him back to life spontaneously generated nuclear weapons out of nothing. So why couldn't you make a person? I... It was very strange. It's not like these drawbacks somehow featured in the plot. They were just not thought of. Or as somebody put it, and I think this is the best way to put it, um, imagine someone releases uh, a Superman movie, okay? And in this Superman, Lois Lane has died in the previous installment of the film series. Oh no, Lois Lane is dead. Superman's all on his own and he's, he's super sad about it. And he's super everything because he's Superman. And so he finds a magic wishing stone and he's like, I wish Lois Lane was alive again. And Lois then inhabited the body of some random woman that we don't know. And she shows up and she's like, hey Clark, I'm, I'm Lois. I'm in another body, but I'm Lois. Look, I'm back alive. And Clark's like, that's awesome. And then they bang. We're seeing the problems here, right? Like people, people would respond to that violently if that happened. Yeah, <laughs> that's great, let's fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I want. What I want out of that movie, DLG, Wonder Woman 1984, the one thing it was really missing, keep everything exactly how it is, but then at the end scene, when Steve Trevor's gone and the dude whose body he's been inhabiting is standing there, and he, like, looks up and the snow is falling and Diana kind of looks over at him knowingly, I just wanted her to go, dude, you got a rockin' dick. <laughs> Bro, you got a stellar hog. And just have him be like, wait, what? <laughs> Yes, exactly. Exactly, TLG. Nice dick, bro. <laughs> that would have completed the film. I'm glad we're on the same page. I mean, it still would have been horrifying, but at least it would have been redeemed with a joke somewhat. I want her to use the phrase, you've got a rock and a hog, though. I, I do request than require that. If I'm going to get a writer's credit on our rewrite, she has to use the phrase you've got a rock and hog. And then it'll be okay. So, perhaps not the most exciting uh, modeling or painting stream you've ever been a part of here today. We have succeeded in cleaning the mold lines off of a whole series of shields, a whole series of leg sets, a whole series of arms holding swords and arms not holding swords, a whole series of torsos, and we haven't quite finished the heads. I'm glad that it was still entertaining. <laughs> For the most part, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and rock on over to the Storm Report, as Metalcore Collectibles has so kindly reminded me. 16 months of subscribing. Holy shit. 16 months Metalcore Collectibles. Fucking unbelievable. By, by the way, ah, I can talk today. I really can. I can word good. Um, by the way, ladies and gents, if you're not familiar with Metalcore Collectibles and the fantastic work that he's done, you can see a couple things of, of his that I painted on my Instagram. Uh, amazing, amazing, modular, 6mm sci-fi, battle max vehicles, all kinds of amazing shit. You can hit exclamation point Metalcore right here in chat. Anytime you want, get a link over to his site. Go check it out. Even if you're not going to buy anything, just, just pop over to the site and take a look at it. See what he's got going on. His stuff prints so damn nice. So damn nice. Just remember to destroy the cameras on the mall so the world conveniently forgets about your superhero antics. Yeah, so that 
in a movie that comes out before that, but is also set later, they can be like, you've been hiding from the world, Diana. You can't hide from the world, and you've been hiding from the world by wearing red, white, and blue, and swinging from statues and rescuing people in malls. And running down highways and shoulder-checking trucks, and... Wait, what? The... DLG, it's almost like... And I'm gonna propose something kind of wild here. So, you know, bear with me. It's almost... Like... Everyone associated with the DC Cinematic Universe is an incompetent asshole. I want to give you Patty Jenkins job. I mean, I do. <laughs> I, I, I really do. I very much want that to be the case. I... How do they keep fucking it up? How is Shazam, like, the only good... And it's not even, like, that good. Like, Shazam has problems. But Shazam is, like, one of the only... It, it is Trotsky, but I think that... I think that saying Wonder Woman was good has to come with an asterisk. In the same way that saying Shazam was good has to come with an asterisk. Because Shazam was good, like, except for a couple of scenes that were really weird. But overall, it was solid. I think Shazam is a better movie than Wonder Woman is. Wonder Woman is, like, flirts with having some good ideas, and then, like, takes a big dump on its own head in the last ten minutes of the movie. If that movie had seriously ended with Ares being like, oh, you think that it's that simple? You think that mankind is warring with itself because I'm messing with their heads? How naive you are. I'm not doing anything. Humans are just fighting. I'm like, I'm helping it along, but I'm not really doing much of anything. This would have been a good story. But... Uh, uh... No, he's just like, I'm responsible for everything. Now let's have a laser fight. <laughs> it was so... Uh, uh, uh. I, that's a point that I'm going to argue, Justicar. I will argue that point to the fucking day that I die. DC has phenomenal characters. DC has some of the best damn characters you're going to find in all of superhero fiction. And they just fucked it up. Real good. Hang on, I'm going to take a look at this base real quick before we continue. Oh, I see the problem. It's not that it doesn't fit flush, it's that I mounted the magnet a little funny. Well, that's okay. I'll live. Ah. <sighs> I could go for a Valium, Joanne. I really could. But yes, yeah, Shazam was fantastic. And I am excited for Black Adam. I am excited for... Um, didn't they just announce that Pierce Brosnan... Just one Thano, though. Not Thanos. I'll take a single Thano. I have a small appetite. Um, Pierce Brosnan is going to be playing Dr. Fate slash Nabu in Black Adam. And the new Suicide Squad looks fucking great. It might be shit, but it looks really good. I am excited for that one. If nothing else, it's going to be a fully fledged comedic DC movie with plenty of violence in it. Um, James Gunn, he comes from a background with Troma Films. If there's any man on the planet that I trust to push an R rating to the absolute limits of its possibilities, it is James Gunn. I think he's going to be amazing. Um, I like all the casting in it. I like that it has King Shark, that we've seen King Shark in the trailer bisecting a man lengthwise. Um, Starro the Conqueror is going to be in it. Like, it has all the ingredients for an amazing dish. It could still be shit but it has all the right ingredients. Milady Comtesse. Milady Comtesse. I don't know. How, how, would I, how would I say that? I can't just put a generic accent on it. That's terrible. But Milady, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. Uh, need to go grab magnets for this what size do I need? Zombie Brush Studios. I'll send you a link to uh, K&J Magnetics where I get my magnets. But generally speaking... Most of the magnets, so I'll just show you here right quick. If you look at these guys, all of the magnet sockets inside the tray are going to call for 1 8 by 1 32nd. Uh, 1 8 by 1 32nd round neodymium magnets. That includes these ones on the bottom here, and these ones in the infantry bases. 
when you get up to the cavalry size, if you wind up using these, these call for 1 8 by 1 32nd and then 1 8 by 1 16th for the base. It still uses the same size magnets for these slots in the bottom. And then if you do the monster base, that calls for two of the 1 8 by 1 16th magnets and then the same size go into all of the other ones. Uh, also included in there, you will notice this little guy. This is the regiment connector piece. This uses two of the 1 8 by 1 32nd neodymium magnets. And this prints best in FDM. You can get away with printing this in FDM, unlike almost everything else. You can do it in resin. If you have an FDM printer, I do recommend FDM because it's going to be more durable. Yes, I'm very pleased with these. Dwickham or D. Wickham? That one's up to you. But these lock in like so, and then you go to connect this to another uh, tray to make your regiment move around on the table, and it just locks in right there. And it still has a little bit of flex, so you can kind of pull it apart, you can wobble it around, and it's going to stay connected. And then, you know, you can scoot your regiments around and have them remain nicely aligned. Oh, that part's not going to get lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the good news is they're 3D printable, so if nothing else, they should be cheap and plentiful. Print a bunch, count on losing some. Thankfully, magnet, magnetic small parts like this, like, you shouldn't lose them if you keep them connected to a tray. It's not just going to come off. Like, you can fold this all the way down here, and it still snaps back into place. But yeah, it's about it's about time, folks, for the Storm Report. You can call me Mila. I know the name is a mouthful. I'll go with Mila. Thank you. Let's go ahead and take a look at what y'all have been posting in the Storm Report. All right, locusts and gentle mechs, get ready to feast your eyes on glorp paint and wet palettes with the occasional culinary atrocity thrown in on tonight's Storm Report. Brought to you by viewers like you. And yeah, WJ, um, yeah, uh, Captain Am the messed up cross between Captain America and the comedian with a pistol. John Cena is playing a character known as the Peacemaker, who I think he's just perfectly suited to play. His his delivery in the trailer is magnificent with his whole... What is it? He, he, one of the other characters tells him to eat a dick. He's just like, you, you, you want to talk about... You, uh, I'll tell you what. If this entire beach was covered in dicks, I would eat every single dick for liberty. One of the other characters responds with, why would a beach be covered in phalluses? He says, I don't, I don't know why madmen do the crazy things that they do. I think he's playing it perfectly. He's, he's leaning into the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, it's funny to... Peacemaker, what? Is that true, WJ? I, that doesn't sound like Alan Moore to me, but I, I don't I don't know enough to say that you're wrong. Peacemaker, I, I can see the connection there. Peacemaker is much, much closer to the comedian than anyone else. Because he, he has some guns, and he thinks that the best way to promote peace is by killing people before they break the peace. Which is, you know, insane. And uh, also, he believes that the spirits of the people that he kill live in the helmet that he wears, and they talk to him. He is kind of comedian-y. I knew that, WJ, but I thought that the comedian... I'm pretty sure the comedian is more... Like, I can see the inspiration. I can see the Peacemaker being a part of the comedian, but I feel like he's, he's more than just the Peacemaker. Eating dicks for liberty sounds like it belongs in The Boys. God, that's a great show. That's a great show. I did not know that, WJ. I always thought that Moore wrote that... Huh. Is it true? Interesting. WJ, we should have a conversation about this. Honestly, because I love The Watchmen. Like, I, I really, really love it, but I won't pretend to be as perfectly versed on its origins as, as, as some of these details that you're giving me, and I would love to hear more. Just finished Invincible. I haven't watched Invincible. I uh, haven't seen The Boys yet, heard it was amazing. Yes. I'm gonna have to look up to remember what I was what I was told to call you. It will stick eventually. Mila, was it? Yes. Yes, indeed, Mila. The Boys is fucking phenomenal. It's, it's really good. Both seasons of it are great. I would argue that season two is possibly better than season one, and season one is really, really good. Alan Moore wanted to use Peacemaker in The Question, but he couldn't get approval from DC, so he came in... Okay, yeah, now, the question in Rorschach seems obvious to me. Rorschach is like a combination of... If you split Batman in two, 
and you push one of those sides in one direction, you kind of get Night Owl, and then you take the other half of him and combine him with the question, and you get Rorschach. But that makes a lot of sense, actually, because, yeah, Rorschach and the question have so much in common, it's kind of crazy, minus Rorschach's serial killer-esque status. Okay, let's do the Storm Report. Let's do the Storm Report. Let's go through this and see what people are posting. Fine. Fine. Let me brush all this uh, styrene dust off my desk real quick so I can put my arm down. It's just so much of it. Been scraping a lot of plastic today, gents. Is up first, like like we got something from Squared here. Got that Vega tank mech finished up for Revelations. This really is a nice. I love the paint job. I want to say Squared. I feel like you should do something else with the base. The texture's good, but what's striking me here is I feel like even if, if if these colors were reversed, this would look fine the way that it is with the warm up here and then the cool body, and then the warm basing just to give you that contrast. As it is, the bottom is kind of disappearing into the base. Maybe that's kind of a goal, because you're doing sort of a camo pattern for down here. If I were doing this, if I were going to make any change, and maybe you're going to do more to this base that we just haven't seen yet. I want this to be blue, like deep jade or deep blue. Oh, thank you so much, Chaotic Harmony, for letting me know that. Hang on. Yeah, hopefully that fixed it. It's just that the, the, the temperature contrast, the contrast in general here between the base and the lower half of the tank is... is and again, this might be a goal. It, it works well for camo for the environment that it's in. It's just to see the details better from a purely... From the, from the position of pure color composition and wanting to see all the details of the mini, I want this to be a little bit more distinct from the base. But that is just entirely my own, uh, you know, take that take that with a grain of salt. If, if you are looking for something that blends into the environment more, I think you've done a good job. But for the sake of being able to see a mini at average viewing distance, I think you want a temperature contrast in there. Otherwise, it's going to kind of blend in. Yeah, exactly. It, it blends in a bit too much. It's doing its job maybe a little bit too well. All right, let's keep going. Uh, lovely work, though, on the orange. The orange stands out decently down here, but right here, that works really, really nicely. And it's, it's well balanced across it from the eye to the two weapons. I really just, I can't think of anything else but the fucking Terminator HK tank, though, every single time I see it. Oh, Chaotic Harmony took Thunderhead's advice on trying a blue jumpsuit underneath the armor, and it works very nicely. So this is a, a perfect example of exactly what I was just talking about. Because Chaotic Harmony before had a slightly warm gray to the undersuit. And here's the thing that we need to understand. Color color isn't just color. It's, it's not just this thing is this color and that's what it looks like. Color is how you see. It, it has to do with how your brain interprets light. And a lot of that is influenced by the colors around the color you're trying to perceive. This can be observed in its most simplest form in, in just, you know, uh, color schemes that's, that are striking. When you see, like, blue and white next to one another. When you see red and blue. When you see green and red, for instance. Like, certain color combinations just, bam, they grab you more than others. And, and, and like I'm saying, your, your perception of a color depends largely on what colors surround it. So you're much better able, I feel, to pick up this really kind of rich mahogany red-brown that you've got going on here with just this very subtle blue base tone to the undersuit. It makes both of them look better. As opposed to if this were a warm gray, then they kind of blend together and you lose the definition on any of them. This is wonderful, wonderful work, Catech Harmony. Thank you for posting this. Seal 6 Operator, I was thinking of you, man. Thank you so much for that resub. Eight months at Tier 2, you absolute maniac. 
yeah, I did the round facer updates last night because I was I was looking at um, what's his name on the Facebook Fang of the Sun Dugrum group has been posting updates from the Fang of the Sun Dugrum battle for battle for Kalnock game, and I was like, you know, I should have more show accurate. Fang of the Sun Dugram figures since I've gone to all the effort of, uh, of sculpting them. So I'm glad you like that Seal 6 operator. I'll make sure that I have the same available for the uh, for the other ones. Because currently the blockhead I think is perfectly accurate for the purposes of the show. I don't think there's any visual differences. I very much went with the original blockhead design. The Bushmaster should similar, sorry, Bushman should be similarly accurate to the show and the Battlemaster is going to wind up looking a little bit different, but I'll make sure that it has the proper weapon. Same for the Hasty. I'll get those updated. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to make a separate thing of Earth's entry for the Sultic Round Facer with the proper weapons. I'm just going to add that to the pre-existing thing of Earth's page, and I'll make sure I post up when I do it. Catac Harmony, though, this is lovely work, and I'm glad that you're having fun doing it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Seal 6 Operator. I do appreciate that. Here we have, from our very own Cyber Knight, Magnatorius Maximus, the one and only Metal Core Collectibles. Well, it is May 20th. Shop just hit two years old. By the way, I'm sorry, I didn't think to mention that. Congratulations on your shop anniversary. Two years. Two years Metal Core Collectibles has existed, and we are all richer for it. Celebrated by pulling everything out for a new group shot. About 50% increase over my pick for March 2020. Still need to paint up more hulls and legs slash torso sets so I can show off more variants at once. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little misleading because you look at this and you get most of the variants for the tanks and you understand how versatile these hulls are down here, but you can't really understand until you've seen it just how many variants there are of all of these mechs up here. There are so many variants of the Tyrant, so many variants of the Oryx, so many variants of the, the, the... Why did I forget? The Hammerhead. The Hammerhead's the name of this one. Helps, because I can see the little thing here. It looks like a Hammerhead. <sighs> Metalcore, your work is, is just phenomenal. Man. Every single variant is painted on his site. Yeah. He goes to a lot of work to have really, really good product pictures. And guys, uh, yeah, exclamation point Metalcore right there. Go check out his website. If you're into 6mm sci-fi... Uh, you really can't go wrong. He has a lot of mechs that are both functional proxies for pre-existing mechs in Battletech, but also they have their own data sheets coming out with the Fan TRO uh, Operation Lancaster. Really, really nice work. Congratulations on the two years, by the way, man. Here we have from Sumatha, speaking of Operation Lancaster, Amuse Me felt like sharing. Edit, they actually replied, well, your wow, your helmets are so amazing. <laughs> That's... That's what she said. I'm not sure if this is ignorance or just trying to not reply to the obviously intended message. Does anyone know how to create this amazing figure? Welcome to like and share Joy Toy Action Figures. Ooh, look at this. Look at this guy here. Seems very familiar. Yeah. Yeah, how about that? Almost like they just kind of took a generic action man and stuck a pilot helmet on him from Titanfall 2. Hmm... You know, sometimes it's like, oh, they drew inspiration from a design. But this is just the same fucking helmet. Like, you got this little greebly here, you got the little side gas mask bits here and here. The exact same shape and connection of the visor, which is very distinct from Titanfall 2. The same top plate here. I don't know if the pilot helmet from Titanfall 2 has this rail system on the side or if they added that, but even the whole ear assembly, like, it's the same fucking thing. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the hard, as we've seen, they're hardly the first people to try to rip off Titanfall 2. I guess I can't complain too much. They're ripping off something that I love to theoretically give me more toys. So, you know, I guess we benefit at the end of it, kinda? Since, I guess, Respawn isn't gonna do it? Uh, evangelizes heavy gear to oh, only just starting to get into minis. Most of your experience is D and D stuff and junk. Uh, Mila, there's a lot. Um, it's 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 a whole can of worms composed of much smaller cans of worms. It's just cans of worms all the way down. Uh, D and D is a good way to get introduced to sort of the existence of minis. Uh, miniature war games are a whole other thing. 
I think that Heavy Gear is actually, like, depending on what you're into, Mila. Like, what, what genres you're into. More sci-fi, more fantasy, more mecha, more aliens, more magic, more low gothic sci- Like, depending on what it is you're into, you can find a system for almost anything and a model range for it as well. I love miniature war games. I love large-scale war games. I love small-scale skirmish games. Um, I hate to recommend Games Workshop to anyone because I personally don't like them, but I would be lying if I said that they weren't a great place to start for people who are new to miniature wargaming but interested in it. Many of their systems are very, very accessible. Um, you can find games for Games Workshop games, whereas if you get into more obscure games, you're going to have to work harder, and I don't recommend that for anyone just starting off. You don't want to be getting into miniature war games for the first time and also have to push them on your friends simultaneously. That's something that should come later once you've decided that this is going to be the rest of your life, as most of us have. They do. They do seal six operated. They make amazing miniatures. Yeah, just a car. They're like, I don't like Games Workshop for a variety of reasons, but one of those reasons is definitely not that they make bad minis. They don't. They make, they make phenomenal minis. Argue, find a group near you who does it and see what they play. Nano tanks, that's good advice. Yeah, I would say that. Mila, if you're interested in trying out miniature gaming in general, seek out your local gaming clubs. You can usually find them on Facebook, or if you have a friendly local game store, you could just ask there. Find out what they're playing and play that. Because finding players for miniature games is always the biggest challenge, and you don't want to be caught out having to craft a community yourself. Yeah, killer minis. Really, really nice. Here we have from Sumatha as well, also because it amused me as well after stumbling across the image to the left. As Thunderhead put it, Titanfall versus Fightin' Tall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is this is Titanfall 2. This is pilot Jack Cooper alongside BT7274. And this is... Something else. <laughs> these are the Steel Knights. I'm pretty sure. I don't think Sumith is here right now, but these are the an image from the Steel Knights line of toys, and it's like I, I see what you did there. But again, I mean, it's not like Respawn Entertainment is giving us great toys of this. So I have a hard time faulting these guys for filling a gap in the market that has been left empty for like. Four years. It doesn't look like these guys are gonna make this style of toy, so you know, these things will happen. And from from the reviews we've gotten from Sumatha, they've all been very, very high quality figures, complete with pilots, and they're super, super duper poseable. Well, thank you for sharing, Sumatha. Here we have from Data Nerd. It is World Bee Day, so here's some of our bees with eggs. The dots on tiny rice-looking things in the middle of some cells, and various size larvae, the sea-looking things in other cells. Ew! Look at them. Look at him. Oh, there's some happy looking little bees, though, I have to say. Oh, bees. I don't know if you guys know much about honey. Honey is fascinating. It's it's sterile. It can be used to treat wounds. It has uh, a, a such a unique, like, chemical profile. It's one of the few substances on Earth, and maybe someone can correct me, maybe my data is out of date at this point, but the last time I read significantly about the sort of miracle that is honey, um, it's one of the few substances on Earth that yeah, it never goes rancid, too. It's, it's amazing. You can use it to treat wounds um, that we can't replicate. Like, there are obviously there are some substances that we are unable to synthesize. There are obviously a good number of minerals that we are unable to synthesize because of the conditions involved in their creation. But honey is an odd substance in that we, it seems like we should be able to replicate it. And we just can't. It's, it's, I, I'm not familiar enough with the particular difficulties, but I know that it, it, it cannot be synthesized. Yeah, sort of like milk. Almost like some species used to feed their young. But don't feed it to young children. Yeah, no, not so much. Not so much. It can definitely help with allergies. It gives you a nice low dosage of a lot of the allergens that you're probably responding to in the local area. Honey is... It's, it's magic. Hundreds of chemical compounds that scientists can't identify and are baffled by. Yeah, it's like... It's one of the few things on Earth that I look at and I just, I'm like, oh, that, that may as well be magic for all I know. It's, <laughs> it essentially is. Can't be synthesized. I'm not going to reward you for that, Drakari. That's terrible. 
Uh, a friend of mine is into the 3.5 edition and Warhammer, so I hear a lot of good about it. Not into Steam or Mecha types so much. Classic medieval fantasy is more my style, and yeah, finding people with the same interests can be difficult. Play on Discord, so it's all digital, no place for minis. Look into Frost. Yeah, Frostgrave is a great one. Has a low model count. You can pick up generic figures, and it's easy to get started. You can play like a campaign with your friends, where it's just like there's a mysterious city full of undead. Go in and get treasure out of it, and you can sort of build your character and level up as you go. If you're coming from D&D, it'll probably make more sense than a lot of skirmish games. Ooh, here we have from Rodan today. The Vampire Lord on Dragon is mostly done to the point that I could put it on the table. I'll have to go back and touch up the wings of the dragon. Oh. Talking about contrast and temperature. Damn. Such a smooth aggressive style that Rodan has, and he's only gotten more so as time has gone on. I love the slight fade of the blue into the red on the wings. Like, the red is... It's its almost cartoonish. But because the blue is as bright and as vivid as it is, it winds up working for me. And then we have a, a, this very, very faint blue-green kind of worked in over warmer tones on the base here. Rodan, this is nice, man. This is lovely. That red really jumps out and grabs you, doesn't it? This is a mini that would look good at 10 feet. I talk about average viewing distance sometimes, and I say 3 to 5 feet is the average viewing distance for a mini, and ideally that is where it should look its best. Don't worry about how it looks up here. Worry about how it looks at arm's length. This is a mini that would look good across the table, like beyond the even average viewing distance. This is a mini that's going to grab someone's attention from across the room. This is gorgeous. This is one of those minis where I look at it and I'm like, you know, don't... Technically speaking, are there more advanced techniques that one could use on a model like this? I don't even think Rodan would pretend that there aren't. There absolutely are. It's fairly simple techniques applied deftly and cleverly. And I mention this because if anyone out there is thinking my techniques aren't advanced enough, they don't have to be. It is so much more about the big choices you make when you paint a mini than it is the tiny little details that you put into it. The tiny little details can look really, really good. They can help you win painting competitions, but that is not the majority of, of, of the painting that we do. That's not the majority of the reason that we're all doing this. And as far as getting an army together, techniques like this... Oh yeah. This is, this is the business. Nicely done, Rodan. Yeah, it looks like blood between the wing spines a little bit, doesn't it? I dig that. Lovely work. Here we have from Justicar06. Not sure how to follow that, but I guess I can put something here. Mad Cat with a base of Grey Knight Steel. The gold is Retributor Gold, and the cockpit is Sybarite Green, washed with Null Oil. Mm. And I think this is a good example of exactly the same thing, Justicar. Like, you talk a little bit of shit about your own work here, but really, I think this is the perfect follow-up. Because this is not as insanely vivid, not as eye-grabbing, but it's also at a much, much smaller scale, and it does utilize a lot of the same techniques. The gold next to the cool white, the, the silvery cool white, winds up popping much more than it would next to any warm color, and then that green right smack dab in the middle of the model creates a nice focal point, and then the red on either side on the weapons, here and here, sort of balance the green in this nice little triangle. You almost have like a little pentagram of color here. It is very pleasing to the eye. One, two, three, four, five. Right here. Boom, 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 boom. I did the star wrong. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, there we go. That would be it. It was lovely work, Justicar. And again, the perfect follow-up because this goes to show you don't have to overcomplicate things to have models that look good. And you still have a lot more to go for this army. Yeah, that's the other thing too. Using simple techniques, particularly for armies, is a good idea. Because you have to remember, you've got a lot more to paint. Don't burn yourself out. Lovely work, Justicar. I agree. Exceptional paint job. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with this comment here, by the way. If I were going to pick something and say push this to make this a little bit better, lens jeweling. Lens jeweling on the cockpit would go a long way. Take it to a much darker green and then bring it out to this light green for the corner and put a little bit of glare. Like, that would look really, really nice. Is Legion stuff allowed in here? Chaos Theory, no, you're banned. No, absolutely. Absolutely, freaking lootly, particularly when you're picking a bunch of Mandalorian characters 
Looks like we've got... That's... Uh, that's, that's not Sabine. Is that her mother? Oh my god. I should know this. This is a character from Rebels, isn't it? I feel very, very stupid right now. But this obviously is Bo-Katan. Uh, Mila, it's when you make a flat piece of plastic look like a piece of glass that has light shining through it. There are some examples on my Instagram. <sighs> Should I know who this is? I feel like it maybe is it Sabine's mother? Maybe? I don't remember. I don't remember the individual armor of everybody who was in Rebels. I love the white and gray up here. I feel sure that these are particular characters, if only because they're all surrounding Bo-Katan. By the way, lovely job on Bo-Katan's helmet here. With the little owl beak and eyes and feathers. Let me see, is there a larger version of this that I can look at? Oh yeah, I can get in nice and close. Oh, that is some fine detail work. Damn. And I really, really like the jetpack smoke that you have going on. It looks like what you did was you printed this in clear resin. And then we went with the ground color for where it's hitting. For like the smoke and the dirt being blown up. And then there's a little bit of a sooty bit here. And then we've gone with clear up to red for where the fire's coming out of the jetpack. This is surprisingly effective. Like if you describe this technique to me, I would have my doubts about it. But seeing it in action is nice. Also, I like how we framed this here with the uh, indoor in the background and them all balanced on your painting handle. Very nicely done. Very smooth work, very clean, very vivid colors, and really, really nice detail work right here. What is the size of Star Wars infantry? I'd love to paint them, but my eyes aren't the best. They are a little bit larger than Warhammer 40k human-sized figures, Joanne. They're about 28mm scale. They're on the heroic end of the 28mm scale. But they're, you know, a little bit over an inch tall. Let me see. I got, I got Darth Vader right here. This is a Legion figure, and it's, you know... Why don't I have anything good to scale this next to? <laughs> Let me hold it next to my beer bottle. That's helpful. <laughs> Bigger than 40k, but not by much. They're still pretty small. The purple and gray Mando matches an unnamed clan Rook Mando. Okay. Are they just... Maybe they were just Mandalorians that fought with Bo-Katan. Because this is definitely Bo-Katan, Christ, right here. And I don't recognize these three, but I love the patterning on them. Lovely work. And yeah, Legion stuff is totally allowed here. Ooh, we got a closer look at them too. Really very clean work. The, the striping on here... I assume done by hand. Incredibly clean and effective. I like your use of the spackle paint rocks. Very simple basing, but it contrasts well with pretty much all of them. Yeah, the white's very solid. Very, very sleek. I might shade it more if I were doing it, but that's me, and you don't have to uh, you can take that with a grain of salt because this works wonderfully with all the other colors that you have mixed in there. Pledged to Bo-Katan during the Civil War, and that paint job seems to match exactly. Okay. It is it is it is unnamed character number 36, as is tradition in Star Wars. Lovely, lovely work, Chaos Theory, and thank you for sharing. Here we have from SP Firestarter, I, prevent, I present my first attempt at 3D editing, Hand Goat. Also known as Hands. Thank you for the reminder, White Wolf. I have a few questions. Fire starter. Uh, firstly, what what gives you the right? And secondly, who who do you think you are? I hate. so much about the things that you choose to be. I... I was having a good day up until now. Things were going really well. Having a good stream, you know, a good conversation, good friends, good beer. 
got some work done on my models. And, um... You know. Then this happened. Here we are. So let's just keep going. Let's, 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 let's just keep going. Let's pretend that Firestarter didn't do that for his sake. I... Give, give me a second. I'll be, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. So that's going to go in the vault with Fifty Shades Chapter 3. In the meantime, we will continue scrolling down the storm report. <clears throat> hmm. Here we have from Kursala. Here's the next batch for Poe and his contest. The Gilded Swordsman is an unreleased model from Ion Raptor. The Dragon is from Strato, with a bit of tinkering on my end. A Polygon Masterworks Timberwolf that's been through a sandstorm, a salvaged pirate machine, a Ryan Torso, Dragonfire right arm, from Lieutenant Shade, Arctic Wolf right arm from Syllogy, Catapult Pelvis and Legs from Strato, and Warhammer Feet from Blar. Good old Blar. Very trusty Dakirod that's been patiently waiting for Data Nerd to not paint it. And finally, the trebuchet that belongs to the Battletoad Squad from the last time. It's a good looking lineup. I like the shading you've done on here. It's it's aggressive. I think fairly effective. I also really like this green that you've achieved on the dragon. I'm sorry, I'm still recovering from the last entry. I, yeah, it doesn't make it any better, Kursala. Probably not showing this full image. And I apologize for that. Yeah, it looks like it's getting cut. Cut off a wee little bit there on the side. I should... I'm going to issue um, some some advisory for the Storm Report for ideal image resolutions. Because there's definitely an ideal image resolution for the way I've got things set up. <sighs> God damn it, Firestarter. I like the camo that you've got across the legs and the Mad Cat here, too. It's really nice work, Kursala. Eh, the trebuchet. One of my favorite and one of the most unfairly maligned mechs. The humble trench bucket. Nice work on the uh, on the urban basing there, too. Very well done. Since we're sticking with the Desert Slash Badlands theme for our games, I decided to print off some crystal formations a few months ago. Finally got around to painting them. They're all done with a thin coat of the base color. Orange, blue, green, and purple were my overlays. And for those of you who don't know, you can hit exclamation point Rainy River anytime in chat. You can get a link over to Rainy River Designs, where Kursala and Data Nerd have a fantastic line of acrylic paints, overlays, and other technicals, which I use a good number of myself. On top of them is some iridescent green flakes, which you might be able to see on the orange and purple ones. Oh yeah, a little bit. Nice looking crystal clusters, particularly for what look, like, look like they printed an FDM. This is a tricky print for FDM, but these actually came out nicely. I think the little imperfections actually lend to the overall effect rather than detract. So shiny. So shiny. Nicely done, Kursala. The Whitworth does it better and can fly. I mean, I agree with you. I love the Whitworth. Everybody else seems to make fun of it, but I dig it. That Timby is a sandy boy. It sure is shit. Is here we have from Cat of Carmody. Pretty rocks for my upcoming broadside kit bash mess. This is one of my favorite projects I have seen Cat of Carmody working on recently. He is instead of using a broadside battle suit for his Tau forces for Warhammer 40k, he is doing a sort of a Tau heavy weapons team 
to act as proxy on the same size base. Lovely basing work here, good use of flocking and texture grit. A lot of this, I understand, is also from Rainy River Designs. I look forward to seeing this one finished. We're going to have a drone here, a drone here, and like a couple of dudes kind of looking through binoculars and aiming missile launchers. Three Tau in a trench coat, sadly, with no trench coat. Did I say, did I say trench coat? I don't think that's a phrase. I don't think that's, that, that's nothing at all. I'm amazed at how thrown I was by the hand goat. Hmm. Needed something with a little sugar in it. Sorry, my energy level is crashing all of a sudden. <clears throat> so this is Wolverine DH's Omega, all painted up and put on the <laughs> the four base combo. Oh man, oh man, that is a big old boy. Nicely done. The paint really helps you see how the lines kind of come together. Simple paint job. Good use of decals with a little danger warning electrical symbols here. You got a little inclusion of tiny bits of uh, caution striping on there. A good example of a fairly simple but effective paint job. A little bit of texture paste down on there, a couple of tufts. Super heavy battle mix. Yeah, this, this is all pretty much heavy, not heavy gear, sorry, uh, battle tech, spaz tech. We're going to be doing some heavy gear next week, though. If you're curious about that, I'll be working on that on Thursday. We can talk some more about it. That's a, that's a big old battle mix. So many guns. Just, just an unreasonable number of guns. I really like the kind of aggressive triangular shapes all pointing right down into the face on this one. Well done, Wolverine. Here we have some Zombie Brush, Zombie Brush Studios playing with secret sauces and some assemb some assembly required. Sorry, that some assembly required is a Patreon, by the way. Teal Sakiri, welcome in. How you doing today, man? Uh, some assembly required. Raptor Two. Still a work in progress as of now. So really love these nighttime looks with the cockpits. Ooh. Very slick. I like how you're using warm panel lining on the blue. And even on the white over here, which is cool itself. We we're talking about uh, temperature contrast. I think this is actually a pretty damn good example of it. What? Why? How the hell do I keep rolling over my own headphone cable? I don't normally do that. That Raptor 2 is just the hotness. I like the little ding, the, the, the caution striping here. Looks like a spaceship mounted on legs. Yeah, the Raptor 2 definitely does have that going for it. That's going pretty good, Teal Security. Going pretty damn nice. Hand goat put the kit. Yeah, it's sneaking around, stuffing my cables underneath my wheels. Really, really good uh, work on the white over here. A good example of how you should never really use white when you're painting white. Just teeny little touches of it getting brighter as you move towards the top of the model. And you can be seen here because we're mostly shadows and grays. And we got little bits of pure white. Bing, bang, boom. Just to sell the overall effect and give it some nice depth. Wonderfully done. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The, 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 the UV reactive paint, that's pretty neat. I like that. You gotta get some some black lights in your game room, so that everybody. The, 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 you know what? I said that. Don't do that. Because that's like really cool when you're showing off the menu and you're like, "Oh, look, it glows!" And then you like look at each other and you're just covered in like, God knows what. And nobody wants to ask that question. You're like, what is it exactly that is splattered all over your face, dude? Oh, uh, it's, it's it's toothpaste. Uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. I'll bet it is. Here we have from Lore Friendly, bit of a slower weekend. Most of it went to purchasing a new living room set. Hooray! But found time to get my guy glued up. Chicken Walker can be built as either a Sidonian Dragoon or an Iron Strider Ballistari for my Admac army. The real trick will be figuring out how to magnetize everything. For context, in, a l in that lot of pieces, I think there may be two or three that glue together. The rest need to be magnetized in some way. This is one of the coolest models. The Games Workshop has, has... No, you should never... No. No one should ever watch something about Mary, even the first time. That's an awful movie, Teal Security, and I'm deducting ten points from Gryffindor for you if you suggest it. I'm not, I'm not drunk enough for this shit. 
This is one of the coolest models the Games Workshop has released inside of the last 10 years, in my opinion. You can't see it from here, you can just barely see it, but it's got these big, long legs that it stalks on, and mounted underneath here, or kind of right here, I guess, you can see the arm. There is a servitor. There's a man with, like, his hands and feet cut off who's mounted in here with his head wired into the display. So this is like a servitor mech being run by this guy, and then the rider sits on top of it and rides him like a horse. It is morbid. It is, it is very, very morbid, and it's I love it. I, I really do love this mini. I have not painted any of the Iron Striders myself. They were not out when I started my Ad Mech Force, but they're they're a beautiful model. I have uh, problems with a lot, like problems. They're just things I don't like about a lot of recent GW models, but this one they kind of knocked out of the park. From Ion Raptor. Finally made an atlas head that doesn't look like crap, so I guess I'm doing one of those now, too. It really is the trick with the atlas, is nailing a head that is both unique and doesn't just look goofy. It's hard to make a robot with a skull and have it not look goofy, man. Good throwback to the last joke I made. I mean, okay, fair enough. But also, eh. <laughs> Well, this is exciting. Ion Raptor streams right here on Twitch, by the way. Has his own fantastic channel where he does a lot of 3D modeling and design. So if you want to watch stuff like this get worked on, taking it from basic shapes to fully completed models one step at a time, go give that man a follow. Oh yeah, this is actually pretty cool. He's got big old angry eyebrows. I want to paint them black. I like the way the uh, nose hole, the skull nose, is kind of hovering in this little bit of void space. That's a nice touch. He's an angry boy. He's an angry mech boy. All right, up next here we have from Squared. Made a spinach and sausage frittata for dinner. I'm going to have to start banning food from this shit because I always get so hungry at this time of the stream. Ah, uh, spinach and sausage frittata for dinner with cheesy zucchini noodles from the air fryer. Oh, my God. Oh god, but that's good. Oh, there's so much cheese. Oh, and there's sausages, and there's spinach, and the cheese is melted. It's just... Oh, there's... <laughs> oh, with noodles to boot. You know what, though? As much as I love this, Squared, I'm gonna say one thing. I'm gonna say one thing that you don't like. I hate your plate. I hate it. I don't know what it is about it. I just hate it. It looks... Yeah. It's a bad plate. I love what's on it. I hate the plate. It makes the food look unappetizing. Which I know isn't true because I've seen part of it on another uh, presentation dish and it looks amazing. Mostly I'm just hungry and I'm jealous of your food so I want to say something mean. So I hate your plate and you're just going to have to deal with that. But thank you for sharing either way. How do you know when it's clean? That is a solid question. It does just look kind of constantly dirty. It was a free plate. Fine to square. We will accept it. Here we have from SP Firestarter a Necron Chronomancer I'm working on. The Space Marines can bite his shiny metal ass. I love the use of the bronze. On this, I will say, for the love of God, man, take better pictures. <laughs> it's, it's Firestarter, come on, man. Work with me here. Get yourself a piece of dark gray construction paper and a bright light, and let's let's work on this problem. <laughs> uh, but I do love the bronze on the mantle up here. That's a really nice touch. Is it going to be repeated lower on the model, like on the ends of the tendrils or anything like that, I wonder? Because this is a color that begs for repetition. But it really helps to sort of frame and highlight his head in there. I was going to ask about that, Kursala, because I was like, did Mila say something wrong? And I clicked to see what the comment was, and it was like, nothing? I'm like, okay. So that's a whoopsie, fair enough. I don't second guess my mods. That is that is a policy that I have. I have mods in this chat and I trust them to do their work well. And even if I find what they do questionable, I do not second guess their work under any circumstances. But I did click on that one and go, huh? Is this like slang that I don't know or something? I don't know. 
Here we have from Lore Friendly Magnets. How do they work? I don't want to talk to a scientist. Y'all motherfuckers lying and getting me pissed. Here we have the Iron Strider being magnetized. It does have a lot of different options. It can be built in as two different variants, and then each of those variants you can have different weapons on the rider, for instance. Um, the nice thing about a lot of these kits is that they actually give you enough pieces you can magnetize it. They've done it in previous Games Workshop kits where certain parts end up being used in both weapons unless you can't swap them very well. The original Imperial Knight kit comes to mind. That one was a real pain to make modular. Nice magnetization, though. Here we have from Justicar06, just gonna leave this here. Real life is a shit-tier game. Oh my god, it is so fucking unbad. I've played this game called Life, and it is pay to win as fuck. <sighs> oh no. Oh, here we are. Oh my, 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 my. That's a saying, right? People say my just like a whole lot in a row? I think I've, I've heard people say my. I love this. I've loved this model since the first time we saw Gus working on it. White Wolf, thank you. I've loved it every step of the way. And seeing it coming together like this is just... It's so ugly. <laughs> it's so hideous in all the right ways. I love how he used the original shapes of the Imperial Knight and then built on top of him for so much of this. So we get this kind of rotted, excreted carapace type look. Oh my god. And it naturally extends down into these spines. Because it is just built right on top of an Imperial Knight. The iridescence in the eyes, the copper, the little bit of green and purple mixed in there. Oh my god. Transition of yellow to green with a tint of blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Across the legs. That sort of slimy green blue. Blue up here on the back where the wings kind of come out. I want a low down shot so that you can see how the mandibles are composed of a rotten human skull, too. Oh, man. I wish that I had more to say about this besides just kind of going, Oh, man. Oh, man. Isn't this good? But, I mean... I just... Gus. Dude. Thank you for sharing this build with us every step of the way. And I know that you've still got some more to do, so I look forward to seeing that, but... If Games Workshop tomorrow posted pictures of this and told me that I could buy it in a plastic kit, I would put serious consideration into breaking my No Games Workshop rule. This is it's, it's phenomenal. It's not even showing off all my favorite details. This is just the head. So much texture, so much detail, so much imagination, so much creativity. I this this is this is for me the pinnacle of what this hobby can be in in so many ways, and. Oh my god, thank you, Gus. Like, really, I, I really appreciate you sharing with the, this with us, and I hope to see more of it. I love this nasty little bit of green-blue right on the edge of all this kind of warm, bone-looking coloration here. Yeah. If you have more pictures, Gus, please, please, please go into the Discord, go to the Showcase channel, and please post all that you have, because I want to see them, and moreover, I want other people to see them. Lovely. Disgusting. Nauseating, but lovely in that sense. Here we have from Roland, been working on some of that heavy gear blitz, it looks like, combining metal models with plastic parts. I like, I like this. Where to put the, the Panzerfausts has always been, like every gear that I build, it's always a little bit of a question, but I like this position here. Kind of down the arm, like he would reach across and kind of grab it and pull it out. I don't have any of the metal figures, I don't think. I think all the figures I have are plastic and or resin. 
including some modification parts. Uh, I need to take a look at what DreamPod 9 is doing and working on right now, see how many more plastic kits they're planning on getting out. I know their plastic kits are a little less flexible than their old metal kits were, which seems odd, but, you know, if you're designing for a sprue. This is a Hunter Urban Combat model. Okay, I gotcha. Well, it's looking damn nice. Big old dag nasty shotgun in one hand there. They've always had quality metal. Yeah, I've not received anything bad from, from DreamPod 9. Uh, I've put in a few orders with them, and I've always been very satisfied with everything that I've gotten back. We're going to be doing, by the way, some... I've got a number... I've got the starter box and some extra bits, and we need to finish off my starter forces for Heavy Gear Blitz, so we're going to be working on that this upcoming Thursday. Oh, here we have from Severe working on these minis as part of the giveaway for my charity drive. Fuck yeah, man. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is definitely the threshold for this painting style. These are the Dwegham Dwarves from Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings. They're very stylized, they're very beard-heavy, and they have lots of, like, flame effects and magma and stuff like that. This looks nice. This looks real nice with the fire beard and hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have such... Oh, man. I like the design of his sword here, too. The extra spikes, like, bolted on. Nice work on the flesh. Very effective. These ones are, are, are barely along. Guys, you should... If you're not following Severe, uh, I would check out his channel and check out his Instagram. He does some really, really fantastic work on Conquest figures. These are... If, these are among the least of the work that I've seen him do in the Dwegham. Obviously, they're incomplete, but... Have to do five photographs of the fly on a black background so I can enter into the contest on the 31st. I look forward to seeing those, Gus Schultz. But yeah, if you're not following Severe, get over there and give him a follow on his channel. If you're interested in Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings specifically, definitely give him a follow. There are a number of streamers right now who are working on this game, so if you want more information, if you want to see more models getting painted, um, Severe, Walter's Workshop, Zombie Brush Studios, uh, Severe, help me out. What other streamers? What other streamers are doing Conquest right now? You can feel free to list them in chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tweet this, White Wolf. Yeah, I hear you tweeting. I don't know how to Twitter. I'm not good at Twitter. I'll start using it more, though. The drones are done for Chaotic Harmony's broadside replacement pro- Yeah, 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 yeah. This is fantastic. So instead of having a broadside, a big mech suit with the two big cannons and the missile launchers, we're going to have these two drones. There's going to be a couple of Tau perched here with heavy weapons and, like, a guy down here with, you know, binoculars. Orcrist, yes, good call. Thank you so much, Sphere. I couldn't think off- off hand, but yeah, Splintered Brush, uh, Orcrist. Is Battle Pixie doing? I don't stop into Battle Pixie stream anywhere near enough. We should get like a little a little list that people can click on and be like, which of these Conquest streamers is going right now? Because with all of us together, I'll bet you can find a Conquest painting stream most of the time. One dude on the lower plateau, one dude on the upper. Okay, so one guy down here and one guy up here. Only two dudes. Okay, fair enough. Two dudes, two drones. I believe I've seen a video on the internet about that. Catacomb, Harmony, lovely work, my friend. Here we have Walter's Workshop crashing this army with no survivors. Finally got some proper pictures, slowly, slowly but surely learning how to snap pics of my toys. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Taking pictures of miniatures is as hard, if not harder, than painting them in the first place. But yes, this is one of the brute drones from the Spire's side of the Conquest, The Last Argument of King Core box. Uh, Walter had an interesting idea here in that the Spire Elves are very um, ostentatious and they custom grow all of their soldiers. These guys, this is not a sentient being by any stretch of the imagination. This brute drone was grown in this form specifically to be a warrior and have no other purpose. Uh, this armor is grown in place around his torso and his head, and thinking, well, bone is a little bit boring. Walter wanted to go with something a little bit more ostentatious, a little bit more elf fancy, if you will. So, we have a whole series of brute drones who are grown with pearlescent, like, like uh, clamshell armor. And you can see it, it's, it's very subtle, but we have some greens going into some reds across the material here. It's all it's all very nicely done. You can definitely tell back here we've got some reds, we've got some greens, we've got some blues. It, it is very subtle. We have some blue here, up to some red on the top. 
Lovely, lovely, lovely work, Walter. And good job on the posing as well, making him look like he's leaping into battle. I love it. I love it. Walter's Workshop, by the way, guys, if you're not following Walter, I mean, what, what, are, you, what are you even doing with your life if you're not following Walter's Workshop? I don't I, uh, A man is poorer for not following Walter's Workshop. This is simple truth. You're only hurting yourself. Go give him a follow, check out his next stream, and ask him some questions about Conquest, because honestly, he knows more than I do. Here we have from Tiberius79. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. You were talking about your uh, your APC from Aliens. God, this is such a good design. Oh, all of the prop design and the vehicle design from, from Aliens is so good. It's so classic. It's, it's aggressive, but also minimalist. It, it's not overdone in any way, shape, or form. These are not designers that felt the need to add extra panel lines just to make what they were doing look futuristic. Um, I love this vehicle. If you've seen Aliens, you probably do too. It's a great movie. With a little turret on the front that we never see do anything. It never does a goddamn thing. I kind of wish that it did. Like, it's far too late now, but every time I watch the movie, I'm like, gee, I wish any of the turrets would do anything at all. I love, yeah, the top turret, which has, like, a little rail on it, because when they go through that low door, the top turret slides off the back and rotates down and then comes back over when it when it has space. The sliding door here, where uh, Frost gets splattered with alien blood and then winds up shooting fire into the interior of the APC. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So I like it so very much. Cool design, no bells or whistles. No, it looks very practical. It looks, it looks believable. It looks like something people would really, really use, and that is such a confusingly difficult Goldilocks zone to nail for a designer. That everyday people, well, at, at least Colonial Marines, at, at the very least, Ark plays games. Oh, you'd love to make it into futuristic vehicles? I mean, I can think of damn worse inspirations for you to start from, I'll tell you that right now. Never seen any of the Aliens movies, Zombie Brush Studios, I am jealous of you. Because here's something you can do now. You can watch Alien. You can watch Aliens. And then you've seen them all. Because there are no movies past that. And you never, ever have to watch any of them. And you never have to know just how stupid everything will eventually become. Watch Alien. Watch Alien, the director's cut. Watch Aliens, the director's cut. You will like them. I'll be curious to know if you like Alien more than Aliens. Personally, I'm an Aliens guy over an Alien guy. Lovely work on this piece, though. And I appreciate it. I have this exact same turntable, so I can actually tell uh, how big this is in scale. And this is for that, that another glorious day in the core game. I would love to see some of the other miniatures from that line. Gray Bios, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the Storm Chasers. Yeah, no, they're completely different movies. Um, Alien is a horror movie. Aliens is an action sci-fi movie. Maybe the most unique thing about the Aliens franchise is that it's basically the same movie being made over and over by different directors most times, giving sort of their own vision of how things should go. Uh, no, not Aliens and Predator. No, Joanne, no. Um, don't watch Alien vs. Predator. If you have to, you could watch Alien vs. Predator Requiem. That movie isn't great, but it's not as just fucking stupid as Aliens vs. Predator. It's at least... Vi you know what it is? It's rated R. Aliens vs. Predator is rated like PG-13. Aliens vs. Predator Requiem is rated R. I feel like that's all I need to say about it. Again, neither one is good. <laughs> but one is decidedly better. Here we have from Mafik, last week's artwork, Hetzer-chan. Another day in the Death Wish Outpost. Oh, it sounds like a terrible outpost. I don't want to be assigned there. Keep the rea- Oh my god, I identify with this so much. Keep your fucking reality to yourself. Well, if he stepped on a landmine. <laughs> Homeboy's up here with his with his binoculars, just like, yep, there goes another one. I told him not to go out there. Mmm. <laughs> I really like your style, Mafik. Is this the one that can turn into a fortress? I can't remember. I remember seeing that one before. It was a tank that could deploy into a fortress. I can't tell if this is that same one deployed or not. I'd have to go back and look at the art. 
I said making a lolly hetzer. I mean, uh, and Death Wish Outpost. Well, oh, you mean it. And Death Wish Outpost was used to be a Blood Eyes clan outpost. The enemy they left a huge amount of landmines laying around outside the outpost, along with tank spikes. As eh, that's probably that, that, that's a good way to leave a, an outpost if you're afraid the enemy's going to occupy it. But it's a large scale version. Okay. Yeah, I thought I recognized some of the shapes there. And I wanted to be sure because it's also kind of slightly positioned behind this little hill and, and pillbox that we have here. And yeah, homeboy right here, who's just like, yep. Yeah. We need new Pathfinders now. Mafik, lovely work. Uh -huh. And here we have the Lollyhetzer. Size doesn't matter. There's a distinctly... Gundam-esque feel to the coloration and the shielding on this one. Though I guess the shielding is sort of meant to be like the top of a Hetzer where this is where the hull-mounted cannon would be that has instead become this gigantic rifle that she wields instead. I like the horns. It's a nice touch. Size doesn't matter. A little devil tail with a little spade tip over here. <laughs> My feek! Your work is always a delight, man, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you, that you like sharing it because it's so creative and imaginative and just fun. Just fun. Just lovely. Oh my lord, browsing browser. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream and welcome my friend to the Storm Chasers. Let's keep going. Here we have from SP Firestarter. Lastly, another update on the Death Scythe, which I confused the other day when we were on chat with. I just assumed he was painting a Gundam because I forget that the, the Necrons ripped off the name for everything that they have. Uh, it's feeling almost done and then I need to finish up on the variant parts. Yeah, nice work with the green panel lining on this in particular. This is a tricky thing to do. Simple, effective, necrony. I like the look of it. What are you planning to do with the base out of Curiosity SP Firestarter? I'd love to know what sort of theme for basing your necrons are ultimately going to have. Horns and a spade tip is because the Hetzer is known as an armored coffin. So, okay, I can appreciate that. Here we have from White Wolf for Setup Sunday. Oh, hey, I'm doing that too edition. Nothing quite like building up your first box of something for a new game, specifically my Spire's First Blood box, because I was curious how those minis built up. Yes, I know of a Wahadrun Warband box, but still, I need to dig into my own. So this is another faction for Conquest, the Last Argument of Kings. These are the Spire Elves. I'm sure if you... This is a larger version of this. Yeah, if you click on this picture and zoom in, you can get a better view of it. We have the Mimetic Assassin. We've got a number of different Force Clone... Force... Force... Force Grown Drones. I'm never going to be able to say that right. Uh, looks like Vanguard Clones, Marksman Clones. I got the first Blood Box. I won it in a little contest, and I need to put that together myself. I want to get my 100 Kingdoms done, and then we're going to paint the Spires, because I think the Spires are going to be more interesting, which means I want to do 100 Kingdoms first. Because if I do the Spires first, then I'm going to lose interest in painting the Hundred Kingdoms. <laughs> so that's what we were working on today. That and everybody's jumping in to play in dwarves and elves and space aliens and all kinds of crazy shit. And I'm over here like, I'm just, I'm just going to be some guys. Just some guys with like swords and shields and whatnot. See some Termagants in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're looking at White Wolf's desk, you're bound to see a number of projects at any given time. Oh, here we have it up close. Here's the Spire's first blood set all assembled. Freaking Tamiya Cement. White top takes a while to set. Funny, though. Not even a Spire's player. I have a feeling I almost want to get more of these particular minis for myself. Got a box eventually inbound for Hubby's Force. Oh, Thunderhead, you're in for a treat if you got Vanguard clones. By that, I mean creative swearing treats on the legs. I got a number of the Vanguard clones, so I'm looking to finding out how much I'm going to hate them. Yeah, look at these guys. I like how they have, the, they don't have faces, they've got these helmets that are grown over their faces and back into their heads. Like, the armor does not come off, and these big creepy bone shields, and they're nasty spears. I have not assembled any of these guys yet, and this looks like the mimetic assassin resin hero character. Lovely, lovely assembly job, White Wolf, I can't wait to get to these myself. Some Spires characters for Hubby's Force, High Clone, or High Clone Executor to the left, Biomancer to the right. I understand that the hero that is included in the core box, the uh, Pharomancer, is not necessarily the best figure, like, rules-wise, but I have to say, of all the designs that they have for the various hero models for the Spires, I like the Pharomancer's look the most. Uh, I'll have some fun painting him when we get to him on stream, but he has, like, 
He has like this World War I gas mask look about him with, you know, the like long elephant trunk like tube hanging off of a mask with big lenses. But the trunk is like bone. It's like a spinal column. It reminds me of the, uh, the original pilots from Aliens, since we're talking about it, when they go into the abandoned ship. Before they decided the engineers were big blue guys. He reminds me a lot of that H.R. Geiger-esque architecture. Learned recently that clone soldiers' ornaments on their head wraps at the top are hooks to move them on. I was wondering about that, Walter's Workshop. That is a delightful piece of lore. Because I've been thinking lately about doing some terrain for the Spires, and I heard that, like, they'll, they'll have the force-grown drones, and they're just, they hang them from racks. Like in these big amniotic sacks, they'll just be lines of the drones, and then when they need to deploy them, they'll just activate them, and they'll, you know drop off. So yeah, these goofy things on top of their heads, these top knots with the rings on them, are hooks to mount them to racks. <laughs> this is disgusting. Uh, because I can't think of anything else to put for the last pick, the pepperoni and bacon pizza pop. Ooh, looked remarkably suspicious when it came out of the oven. Hope it isn't a mimic. It does look like it's about to take a bite out of you. To be fair, here we have from SpazTech getting some metal on the mammoth. Ooh, that's a big boy, isn't it? Oh, I love how brutal and chunky and nasty and textured the armor is. Ooh, that's a pretty cool project you got going there. I missed the... There's a spoiler? I missed it? Uh, oh, yeah, I did. It wasn't. It was tasty. Okay, well, it's good to know that you haven't been eaten by a pizza pop. That's some meaty Audrey, too. Oh, feed me. The Pharomancer is good for support. I'm glad to hear that, Sphere, because otherwise I'm going to wind up playing Suboptimal List just because I like the look of and the concept of the Pharomancer. Needs wash and rust. Well, I figure with all the masking, we've got a number of steps to go here, Spaz, but I'm loving what I'm seeing so far. That is a really nice metallic, by the way. What paint is that? I'm liking what I'm seeing on the more fleshy tones and the horns as well. Please continue to share as you work on that. Here we have from NB Toby, the smallest things I've tried printing on my Ender Missile Turrets, multiple parts. Ooh, that is... It's Itty Bitty. He's just a little turret. You can get away with printing pretty small things. It, it has more to do with the shape and orientation than anything else. This looks like it came out pretty okay. Ooh, what are you planning on doing with these, NB Toby? Big, dead, nasty missile launchers. Well, nice, clean, smooth-looking prints. Can't wait to see some, uh... Put on my... Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes good sense. I promised turrets a while ago, and I never delivered them. <laughs> because I've been working on other shit. So that that makes sense. There are turret hardpoints. I'd love to see that when you get them put on, NB Toby. Please, please, when you get these put on the Trinity City or other... I don't know if you're using the two high walls or the four high walls. But whichever ones you wind up using, please post pictures. I would love Love, love, love to see that, and bing, bang, boom, that'll bring us to the end of the Storm Report, and thus, if you've been paying any attention, to the end of tonight's stream. Oh, oh man. Man, oh man, who are we raiding tonight? Is Teal, is he going? Let's have a look. I don't want to say that we're definitely raiding Teal, we're probably raiding Teal. But I want to look. Who do we got? Who do we got? Who do we got? Teal's going. Deckard's playing some World of Warcraft. Mini Monster Paints is doing some Warhammer. Commander Mittens is doing some painting. 46 and 2 is going. Shorty Paint Studios. Everybody's doing Warhammer. Everybody's always painting Warhammer. <laughs> Teal Sekiri is working on a bust that he has been working on very hard this month, so we're definitely going to raid over there because I think that that is, is, is worth watching. The man does really, really good work. Boom. Let's get that going. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. You guys make it such a pleasure to come out each and every time we stream. Thank you all so much for being here 
today. I had an absolute blast, and I hope that you did too. If you're in chat right now, and you're pretty much done for the night, and you're thinking about turning in, um, if you feel like doing me a favor, stick around for just a few minutes for this raid to go over to Teal Security. Check out his stream. I think you'll really, really like it there. He's a great streamer. He has fantastic content. He's working on some unique artistic challenges right now, and he has a great community. So stick around for a couple minutes, see if you like it, and if you do, you know, drop the guy a follow. Uh, Teal Security's a fantastic streamer. We are going to be back Tuesday, May the 25th, painting some Warcaster Neo Mechanica, continuing our work on our Iron Star Alliance forces for that. Painting metal minis is always fun. Thursday the 27th, we're going to be digging into some heavy gear blitz, trying to get our starter forces for that actually finished up after starting those like last year. And then Saturday the 29th, we're going to be having a bottom of the barrel movie night on Discord. If you're wondering what that is, we're going to be watching bad movies. It's going to be a thing. All right. And then on the 30th, uh, Sunday, we'll be back for some more Conquest and Oils. Huge thank you to all of our new followers today, all of our subs. Oh my God, my mod team, as always, I'm going to send you over to Teal Security now, so until next time, keep on painting, folks.